Hello everyone and welcome to the Bill Beautiful podcast. You're joined tonight with me and my co-host Gilly. Hello. Where, thanks uh, for coming on Gilly. Um, t- tonight we'll be discussing uh, vernacular architecture. Um, we're trying to give a, an introduction to uh, the vernacular architecture of the world and in this episode uh, we'll be giving a, uh, a brief overview of, of what a vernacular architecture is and uh, some of our thoughts on the value of vernacular architecture, uh, the different uh, materials that you'll find in vernacular architecture, and then we'll be going into uh, buildings from Asia in this episode. So to introduce the concept of uh, vernacular architecture, I'll uh, read out the introduction to the book, Handmade Palaces and Other Buildings by John May. So in Handmade Houses and Other Buildings, The World of Vernacular Architecture by John May, He says in the introduction, this book is an introductory guide to and a global tour of some of the world's vernacular architecture, which is defined in simple terms as the vernacular architecture, which is, I'll start that again. This book is an introductory guide to and a global tour of some of the world's vernacular architecture, which is defined in simple terms as the architecture of the people designed and built by communities, families, and self-builders. It is also a book with a message. Vernacular architecture is an important global issue for our time. The dean of this vast subject is Paul Oliver, who initiated and edited the standard publication on the subject, the massive three-volume encyclopedia of vernacular architecture, impossible to buy, but available in some libraries, and many other key works, including dwellings, The definition that he uses in both the encyclopedia and dwellings to define his subject is comprising the dwellings and all other buildings of the people related to their environmental context and available resources. They are owner or community built utilizing traditional technologies. All forms of vernacular architecture are built to meet specific needs, accommodating the values, economies and ways of life of the cultures that produce them to which could be added, they may be adapted or developed over time as needs and circumstances change. In another of Paul Oliver's works, Atlas of Vernacular Architecture of the World, produced with his colleague Marcel Berlinger, we learn some extraordinary things, among them that no one knows exactly or even approximately how many buildings there are in the world, but estimates of over, well over a billion have been made of these 80% or more are estimated to be vernacular buildings. Put another way, buildings designed and built by professional architects and builders constitute only a small part of the world's built infrastructure. The vast majority of people in the world live in homes and use buildings that they and their friends and families have built themselves. This is obviously more true in some countries and regions than in others. In the Western world, planning restrictions limit self-building land is expensive and the traditions of our forebears and ancestors have been marginalised, their skills lost and forgotten. In other large parts of the world, in Africa, Asia and Latin America, people are closer to their vernacular architecture, and in many cases are still living in it and building it. However, the situation is changing fast. The rush to modernisation means that more people than ever before are moving to cities where vast numbers now live in squatter settlements where they construct houses from waste and scrap. This is the new vernacular architecture of our time. All over the world, meanwhile, traditional vernacular architecture is disappearing. Not only the building forms themselves, but also the knowledge, skills and customs behind their creation. China is an outstanding example of the battle being fought to protect vernacular building forms for the march of the bulldozers. Academics and NGOs seeking to educate the country's policymakers about the value and importance of preserving traditional architecture, but their efforts are outweighed by the huge commercial pressures driving a rush to modernization. And now we come to another world issue. How are we going to house our new arrivals? As of 3rd of August 2009, the US population is estimated by the United 
State Census Bureau to be 6.775 billion. It's estimated to reach 9 billion by 2040. We are not going to be able to house our future generations in concrete blocks. Apart from other considerations, climate change predictions and concern over the rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide precludes this. For each new bag of cement, a bag and a half of carbon dioxide is created as waste. This is why many architects and designers, aid organisations and others are looking at vernacular architecture to learn how to build using local materials and live lightly on the air. Any examination of vernacular building is full of surprises and by its very nature is interdisciplinary. These buildings do not exist in a vacuum, they are built as part of people's lives and culture. These structures are shaped not only by physical circumstances and available materials, but also by the beliefs, myths, customs and traditions of the tribe, clan or group that builds them. Early vernacular shelters were once considered primitive, whereas now we look on them with more respect noting the ingenuity employed to fashion functional and aesthetically pleasing structures with simple tools. It is fascinating to consider the wide variety of structures in which people choose to live, which includes tents and caves, pile dwellings, courtyard houses, log cabins and mud towers. Also noteworthy is the manner in which similar basic materials such as earth, brick, stone, timber, bamboo, palm and reed can be employed for different purposes. Forms are expressed in whatever material is close to hand. Therefore, a roof may be made out of almost anything, grass, thatch, clay tiles, wooden shingles or corrugated iron. The majority of examples given in this book are houses, but we have also investigated the step wells of India, the churches of Chile, the windmills of Holland, the big barns of the USA and the big houses of Slovenia, which remind us that vernacular building is a broad term, including places of work and worship and communal facilities. Many vernacular buildings are beautiful as well as functional. Some demonstrate a wealth of detail and decoration. Doors and windows are carved with geometric motifs. Walls are elaborately painted and domes are topped with ostrich eggs and finials. Above all, vernacular design must be fit for purpose. Nomadic peoples build lightweight structures which can be easily be packed up and reassembled. Sedentary people build permanent homes that can last 500 years, during which time they are constantly renewed and adapted to suit changing requirements. As a general rule, vernacular builders aim to stay warm in winter and cool in summer, and they have devised numerous ingenious techniques for achieving those ends. The desert architecture of Iran incorporated air conditioning systems that have a great deal to teach today's house builders. We must tackle the uncertainties of climate change. Many vernacular buildings around the world are devoted to revered ancestors. These buildings are often constructed in precise alignment according to spiritual beliefs. The interiors are arranged in a similar manner with precisely placed central hearths and shrines to the family. In, Mag in Madagascar, the Zafir Maniri house, the family home co-evolves with the relationship of the couple who live in it. In other examples that we have selected, the women are in sole charge of house building or their role may be to paint and decorate. In almost all cases of vernacular building, women and men inhabit separate, clearly defined spaces. Such is the whole variety of vernacular forms which encompasses towers and domes, subterranean dwellings, giant circular communal fortresses, meeting houses, cabins, shacks and huts, that this collection is inevitably partial and selective. We have covered the globe drawing interesting examples from each region and have tried to profile a satisfying mixture of structures in order to do justice to the subject's complexity. And it just, yeah, it goes on to thank people. But um, just one brief note I'll say is, uh, probably picked it up on it already, but there is um, quite a lot of people who, who uh, study this Part of architecture, vernacular architecture, are, are quite uh, left leaning when it comes to climate change, shall we say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I, I think that was actually a quite a good uh, definition, quite extensive. Maybe a, 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 a kind of a lot, a lot to um, pick out from. I think one of the things I'd, I would highlight from is, is I think vernacular architecture is treated as 
a, in a sort of an acceptable way to engage with the past um, for, for modernists, for, for, um, because they ha- emphasize the sustainability of it. Um, you yeah. know, the, um, whereas I, I think the, a, a sort of, a, you know, I could be proved wrong here or not, but I'd sort of throw out that vernacular architecture, when, it's, when people were building it, they aren't, they aren't there thinking, I need to be sustainable. They're just thinking I need to keep the rain off my head and my yeah. family warm and such like. There's a, a it, you know, it, there's not this sort of highly conscious, um, sustainable agenda that's that's happening now. Um, and I, I think, yeah, the, that's the, a good point. That yeah, I, I, I just think it's, um, it's kind, of, it's a lot of the definitions I've looked at kind of underplay, you know. Um, the beauty of them or the, the craft and the, the, um, yeah. you know, the, the uh, embellishment that will go on in the or, you know, ornamentation, even yeah. though um, vernacular architecture, I think it has come, it comes from a, a needs must, a sort of imperative place. Yeah. Um, the, the human touch is very evident always in it. And I think that is often overlooked by uh, the modern, modernist kind of going oh you know we can build like this using kind of uh rammed earth or straw bales and and you end up with this fairly uh, kind of odd um clash of modernist um soullessness and then this sort of raw um use of materials that it is sort of ne- yeah. ne- neither understanding either uh, sort of um place um I think that's an interesting point that it's sort of um, because I got this quote in um, in my slides uh, from Wang Shu, and he says um, he what he he makes his students do. Wang Shu is he makes his students, his first year students in architecture learn. uh, They spend the the first year learning a craft, you know, such as carpentry or bricklaying, and. because he says uh, only people who understand the nature of materials can make art using the materials, which I think is true. And yeah. I think we, in contemporary architectural education, I think we've got away from that well, idea I'm, between I, thinking and making. And absolutely, you, um, yeah. I mean, you see, uh, you see that in vernacular architecture, the thinking and the making they go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, there's a number of things I guess I, I want to mention here of. Um, it, you, the whole idea of, of vernacular architecture is not, it's not a style. It's not one thing. It's not even something that you can particularly easily define. And I'd say it's predominantly or maybe exclusively a, a retrospective term. No, no one can consciously be kind of, I'm now going to make some vernacular architecture. I think almost in that, uh, as soon as you're conscious of it, you're not going to make it. Um, uh, which which comes to one of a definition I did find, but um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm so, yeah, um, I, I guess there, there seems to be some overlap between vernacular architecture and traditional architecture. The, those well, well, I guess inherently there's going to be tradition involved, and you know, a, a thing with vernacular architecture is you know you're dealing with you know a group of people will settle somewhere, they will start you know, developing skills, developing, you know, how they do things or doing things how they used to do things. And then maybe someone else will turn up and then, you know, the technology of, of how they're doing things will will evolve and develop. They'll draw upon um, other people's influences um, or, or, you know, you, you know, your neighbor, you'll see, you know, has done something well and you turn to them and say, I, I want a barn or a house too. And you all make it together and you make it as you go you know you don't sit down with a piece of paper and draw it out and then um you know go to planning and go to building regs you know you're you're it's a very intuitive um uh process um uh you know a direct um uh, um engagement and pro- probably quite social uh well I'd, inherently i think yeah um, and that pass that passing down of traditions from father to son or yeah, yeah, and and you know, and it, it, you know, as as you know, if you think of you know, if you've learned something from 
your uh, early years, by the time you're in your 30s, you're going to be so knowledgeable that you'll kind of go, well, actually, I could try it a slightly different way. And, you know, or you, because you start to understand the, the, you know, what the technology, you better understand uh, load bearings and, uh, you know, the, the, the way that weather impacts or, or, you know. What you can um, do with certain you, materials. Yeah, or maybe you, you, can, you know. Do. You know, maybe yeah, or you, or you move to a different location that has different type of uh, timber or stone that that reacts differently to what you're used to, um, and so that that skills that you had start to adapt and uh, respond to those. Um, so it's it's a very I think it's a very elusive thing. It's um, um uh, yeah, I, I I think the way to determine sort of what you know how you know how much something, and I'd say something is sort of maybe on a scale rather than definitively that's vernacular and that's not. Um, I, so um, if I could touch on it briefly, there's this, I think, a really interesting um, uh, a couple of definitions to start to understand what is and what isn't vernacular. And um, uh, this one thing, I, I, I liked how this was described. It's a polite scale. It's a, a polite threshold. And the intention here was, or the, the, the point that they're making here is, the more polite or the more conscious is, is a sort of translation of that, if um, the architecture of the building becomes, the less vernacular it becomes. Um, and I, I, think, I think we're now at a point of hyper awareness of we're hyper polite with our architecture. Um, and so it, there isn't that, um, you know, so the, the, the vernacular, the, the the amount of vernacular, I guess maybe is a way to see it, it has reduced. Um, but yeah, and also on a slightly different way of looking at vernacular architecture is we're also going to lose a lot of it as time goes by at different scales of it. So the as we look back into further back in time, most likely um, put smaller uh, buildings would have been timber or you know perishable materials. So our understanding of, of vernacular further go further look, looking further back is going to be more more grand buildings more significant buildings that have managed to stand the test of time um uh, so i i think it's I, I think it's a good thing to as we go through examples to keep in mind how sort of how vernacular is it and and where are influences creeping in from maybe other places or um um you know, um, uh, you know what what really grounds it to a to a location. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting uh, area, definitely. Yeah, because yeah, I guess you could say that when you start getting into like temple architecture or or things of that nature. Um. Yeah. I. I, I mean, you you're going to have to. Yeah. You, you're dealing with like. Uh, uh, you know how how um lo localized is that how specific or, or how do you separate between it might be a like a national or regional re sort of uh like religion but then it's in it, it's embodied in its buildings differently to that particular area or that, that very particular region because uh you know you you know if it's a mountainous area or a, a you know um a valley um and the materials aren't as available um uh so yeah you it, it, it's an interesting thing to look out for of, of how even within um you know within a small area things can change things can vary and uh express differently uh, from a the same kind of cultural cultural background or religious background um uh, yeah was there i mean was there there wasn't anything more on that that you wanted to cover before going on to the next part uh no maybe just one thing um just regarding um uh, more like modern architects uh, often trying to uh one of the i'd say the main issues in contemporary architecture is how to create a contemporary vernacular um, and in many ways, that 
that term is an oxymoronic term because uh, exactly an architect yeah. can't create vernacular architecture uh valid yeah. factors in architect but also um like the main issue in or one of the main issues in modern architecture is how do you create uh like contemporary architecture which has a regionalist feel or you know a feel which it, or get with feel in which the building organically sits in the site or you know or which the you know you can feel the context is very important to the building or but you know yeah. when you can actually order you you can actually order your materials from anywhere in the yeah, world i i mean i i think there's so many factors that make it so I mean, virtually impossible even if you're endeavoring to be uh as vernacular as you could be um i mean i i, I think straight off the bat you know modernism comes out of the international style it is it is in, inherently not it, it it doesn't want to be um uh, and that's why I, th I think is another kind of it's an endless contradiction or kind of um uh, you know confusion that the modernists have to deal with um as they as they come to terms with the fact that you know inherently you know in the sort of heart of modernist tradition is concrete steel and glass it is about doing uh, having a blank canvas um you know un unnatural forms you know ge yeah. you know um and it's you know it, 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 you know the obsession with flat roofs. Flat um, roofs yeah. You know where where do you see flat roofs in vernacular architecture? You see it in deserts. You see it in places with low rainfall or next to no rainfall. You yeah. see pitched roofs all around the world wherever there is uh, a normal kind of seasonal climate. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I think our, you know, modernists um, cannot because of the. the 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 kind of conflict or the, the the kind of impossibility to accept traditionalism as yeah. in i mean sort of big t traditionalism as in like classical architecture or gothic architecture um yeah. their their sort of fear of being seen to to open the door to that uh, to legitimize it again as, as a mainstream um, architectural style or approach the only way to do it is to sort of kind of do it through the back door through um a vernacular spin and so everything about vernacular i i've listened i listened to some lectures of uh an architect um who who i know of and um you know she she's it's so it's frustrating because she's sort of she can see it but she can't um admit to it and uh you know what makes uh and, and yet she you know she was blaming like you know Barrett homes um, for not, uh, you know, the, the the red brick boxes with pitch roofs, um, yeah. as as if she can offer a genuine regional, um, you know, genuinely responsive architecture to, you know, because it's not just geography, it's culture as well. But then, I mean, the biggest problem that uh, the, you know, major problem here, I think, that architecture has is. What culture is it responding to? What culture does it grow out of? Um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, yeah. It, you, you, when, when when you're back in the Victorian era and before, you know, you had a, a wealth of culture to draw upon um, that was strong and secure and, and uh, you know, lived. Um, whereas I think this, one of the issues of, of some of these sort of, I think this is a broader issue in, not not just with vernacular architecture, but with traditional work, yeah. is is what what culture is that coming out of? You know, um, how does that link with the just the, the mere fact of what today is like? Um, for ever, you know, ho however much we like or hate it, um, um, you know, it, it's it's something that I'm grappling with. Um, and I think, and I, I think you know, there are. Um... There are modernist architects who are more regionalist in their approach, I think, as well. Um, such as, I think, like, uh, a good example would be, like, Alvar Alto. I think he's got a very oh, yeah. Finnish feel to a lot of his work, you know, especially, uh, like, when you go past his early phase, he, he always seems to have, like, um, 
a certain feel to his work, which you know, growing out of the culture. I think he rejected. I think he rejected that um, that global, you know, homogenizing um, factor. The global that global homogenizing uh, area yeah. of architecture, which is the international style. Yeah. Like if you look at something like Sinat Sal or Town Hall, or you know, yeah, like yeah, Villa Maria. I, I think there is like a good. Uh, Modern well, firm, I think, who have a good, um, like a regionalist feel to their work is uh, the the Vietnamese firm Vo Trong Nghe Hire, and they, they do a lot of work in bamboo. Um, Interesting. Eh? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I th you know, I think. Um, but you are right. I think, the, it, you know, it, the international yeah. style and, and uh, like well, things like brutalism and. Uh, Deconstructivism and parametric blob architecture. I think there are, they are but all. Like, it's inher inherently globalist. I mean, yeah, just inherently yeah. that that is you know it, it goes it goes on to you know we don't you know, we talk of star architects now that you know, you know that you know Richard Rogers can be picked up and put anywhere in the world to produce one of his you know logo buildings, um, and it doesn't really matter where you are. I mean. It, I think also I would say engaging with context is it is is it can be a misleading thing there because um, yeah it's one know, of those terms in it like materiality or, you know it's, yeah it's, but it's like quite what do you mean by engaging with context because you can engage with context in a in a quite an aggressive way and in in a provocative way yeah um, and you know you're engaged but um, is it um, you know, and I guess um, that's where I think it's um, it. It has to be a a harmonious, um, you know, um, sensitive con contextual engagement, and uh, that isn't trying to be conceptually witty or um, you know, um, uh, well, individualistic even. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, um, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think that's another thing to. That there's an interesting one to think about is is you know, in you know, uh, how much does buildings vary i mean i think a lot of i mean you know some of these examples that we we're going to look at are obviously temples and stuff that are quite you know they're they're distinct and uh, you know um such like but um more humble architecture is potentially going to be quite repetitive um you know, if I, you know um, but then where the character comes in it could be you know the small detailing the, the very the very human scale of maybe a, 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 a doorway or um, you know the a, a junction in structure that that you could add a bit of character to or you know a, one thing that I've picked up in my readings is um, uh, thatched architecture in England um, uh, you know, you'll get you 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 know each Thatcher will will uh, weave and pattern the um, you know the straps in their own particular way, and and then people might have spotted you get sometimes little um, like ridge details or um, like finials or um, even a witty scene like a, a a bird created out of the thatch, and so even though thatch is everywhere and you know, quite impersonal in some regards you that little human touch that character of the craftsman is coming through and is it has he has his moment to express himself um but it isn't the big gesture of today it's not the uh take a look at me yeah. almost shouting at you isn't it like uh to the work of cool hats or Hadid or Geary or any of those, you know, star architects. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I'll just um, move on to uh, talking about what I think is the value of uh, uh, vernacular architecture. Yeah.
Hello. 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 Yeah. Don't know what's that noise. Is that? Is that me or is that you? Was that you? I I I, I tried to mute, or I was muted. I thought. Yeah, that's better, I think. So I just wanted to go over the um, what I think is uh, why I think the value, why I think vernacular architecture is uh, valuable. So I had a few notes. Um, hmm. Basically, um, one of the reasons I think is uh, is uh, rootedness. It gives you know it gives you a rootedness which we don't often see in the modern world due to uh, the global homogenization that we see with uh, modernity. And we see that in uh, every corner of the globe, every continent, you see it in the architecture of uh, like the main cities. So I'd say, look, this, this one here, this image here is uh, of the London skyline. And um, yeah. this image here is uh, of New York in Manhattan. Uh, this one is uh, an image of Sao Paulo. Uh, this one is an image of Shanghai. Um, this one is an image of Johannesburg. Uh, and this one is an image of uh, Melbourne. And you can see how, well, ever since roughly 1914, that, uh, you know, diverse material cultures have been uh, just uh, raised to the ground, really. And you know we we see these these dull monotone environments uh, all across the world now, and um, it, it goes to show how the the real diversity within the world, you know, not the the fake diversity that gets shoved down our throats every day, but the real uh, beauty and, uh, and diversity that's in the world is um, rapidly uh, vanishing. Yeah. So we, throughout history. Uh, there's been you know diverse ways of living and adapting to the climate one fans themselves in uh, yeah i i think this is a great example of just flicking through these uh, skylines i i um i did a while back i did a, a just an exercise to to i go onto google earth type in architects uh, so you you know search everywhere and zoom in and just randomly as randomly as you can do spin around the world and find a practice and then just look at their their example projects and it and it's uh, it is shocking to just see you know if you've got a young ish contemporary practice more you know um it, it, you know that there there's barely anything to pick them apart and you you can go to scandinavia to um South Africa to Japan to America to South America to any part of Europe and Russia and it's all it, it's just uh, everything's the same it, to actually stumble across something that generally picks up on the culture and the context the, the genuine context and everything is so rare nowadays uh, it seems it seems but um, yeah I've got this um this wonderful uh, quote from David Bowie, actually. Um, it's, it's from his song, uh, I'm Afraid of Americans. Um, so David Bowie had uh, this, this song called I'm Afraid of Americans, and um, he, he, he describes uh, his feelings uh, behind the song. So, quote, it's not as truly hostile about Americans as, say, born in the USA. It's merely sardonic. I was traveling in Java when its first McDonald's went up. It was like, for fuck's sake, the invasion by any homogenized culture is so depressing. The erection of another Disney world in, say, Umbria, Italy, more so, it strangles the indigenous culture and narrows expression of life. So I think that puts it very well, to be honest yeah perfect um it, uh, there's definitely a conflict now though in you know uh, i there's another thought that did come to mind is is one of the other things about um modernists kind of the acceptable 
part of vernacular architecture to to modernists is a sort of fetishize the fetishization of the primitive um you know the, the primitive world um and, you know and i i yeah um the you know that you can learn from uh a, a, you know a, a, a tribal you know um architecture you know buildings um that's perfectly acceptable lessons to take from there but but it's weird that we can't learn from our own architectural legacy you know that that's that's off limits but this sort of weird fetish fetish of you know the exotic and the uh uh, primitive it's like there's it's almost like in in a modernist's mind if it becomes too sophisticated to um then it, it's like, oh, can't call upon that, even though, you know, there's so questions over that. Scroll, did scroll have a word for someone who, who oh, uh, someone else's culture more than uh, their own? Well, so, it's, uh, I think, I, I think you, what you might be talking about is, um, like oikophobia, o- oikophobia, is that it? yeah. So, oikophilia, the love of home, and oikophobia, the, the hatred of home. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that brill- brilliantly you know sums up um so that that mentality um it, you know it, it just cannot you cannot accept anything um from you know from your your own past or you know you, you can't be rooted in anything um yeah that, that's or, one of the points yeah. i got um uh, why it's valuable vernacular architecture it gives you a rootedness it it connects you with your ancestors it keeps you in contact with your roots it's is a source of identity and a source of pride in one's uh, religious, ethnic, and cultural heritage. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just uh, yeah, the, just the co- the conformist nature of the sky- these uh, environments as well, like with a skyscraper, kills any unique sense of identity. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do think. I was sort of half mentioning it earlier that I I think there's it, it's so apparent and it it's you know and the 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 sort of environmental almost the environmental agenda is is like a um, a surprising like um, saving grace in some ways or to to traditionalism uh, more broadly um, because it you, you it just can't um square it anymore you can't you know, how much more can we build uh, you know glass clad uh you know um tower blocks that are yeah. you know, made of uh, concrete huge concrete uh panels and huge con- uh, steel uh steels that uh you know it, it it's there's no mo- no matter how much they try and um kind of try to offset it or justify it or you know it doesn't it doesn't add up especially as inherently these things have such a short lifespan yeah you know, that's that's the other thing if you know if we're looking back and enjoying uh, it, you know engaging with vernacular architecture you know it's because it's survived as well i mean yeah. it survives yeah, both in 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 its physical form but also as you say like that it is that um it's stood the test of time but, hasn't it it's, it's yeah, proved that humans can live in those environments but yeah it's 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 stood the test of of uh, uh you know um generations using it and going this this works that doesn't work so well and and, and each generation has you know chipped in their their bid um whereas you know what you know what will uh people people do with these buildings in you know 100 200 years time yeah um yeah that you know that this is an, another big thing that scrutiny goes on about is is um you know if if, if no one loves something if no one is there cherishing it you know, why will it stay it's not going to stay and um uh, yeah that's a great point um uh, and i i i think that's what i'd say is is what's so important what what's under emphasized in vernacular architecture is is that that you know it's clearly it's you know these buildings that have been loved you know again it's another reason why they've survived as well um 
but um what's you know what is interesting and i i, I really hate that the argument that um you know, um that you know the only reason why old buildings all look good is because it's the good stuff that survived um i, I just think that's a you know, moronic argument but it um that i've heard a few times but um uh i i think you know i've got some uh images some postcards up uh, around my desk of barns um you know that just a very utilitarian structure um is full of such charm and uh delight to us um you know even now and you know these barns all over the country that have survived um even beyond their usefulness um so i think i think there is something about yeah. that lots uh, of people have converted them haven't they into housing well, exactly yeah. but I, I i think it's something about your vernacular architecture again is 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 it's very it's so connected to the the touch and the people that built it like so this image that we're looking at now you don't yeah. get any sense of the 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 men that built these buildings you, you know they yeah they you know the, the the lives that they were having during the 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 year that they were constructing these things you know um, no individual sense of character the there's not that the trace, trace of the human touch of humanity or you know um uh, so it's just it's just a block it's just a you know a lump um the, you know how and then you know we're on a you know how do you Im embody uh, any level of meaning of of um character of identity or um affection to something that is so formless so um you know inhuman uh, you know, so you know it, it, the cityscape and the our built environment becomes so brutal and you know um yeah, it's killed the high quality of our built environments it killed the high quality of our built environments yeah you know, I, 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 if it's left left us um these cold sterile soulless you know places to to live in yeah uh, um i mean it's it's a it's a um a multi multi front you know multi um attack that's um uh, you know d destroyed so many um town centers and and cities um a few still remain i i was uh, so i i live in oxford and i always um i always give the there's a, a lane in oxford called um new college lane um which is quite famous um but i i give that as a really good example of uh if that was a modernist uh uh if that had been done in modernist materials it would be uh, um you know a rape alley it would be you know filled with graffiti it'd be horrible everyone would keep away from it it is it's a winding lane with high walls uh you know uh, you know twice the height of uh, you know at least um uh and it, it zigzags around um yet it's it's one of the most beautiful lanes i know because you it, there's um different material the, the stone changes is pr predominantly all stone but the different quality of finish of stone and the different bonds and uh, arrangements of it and um then you get glimpses of the buildings beyond the wall and you get plants that grow over it and then little gates and and the gates are inviting and they or they're you know they they have a um uh a, yeah a kind of a, a um a softness to them or a pleasant you know inviting this nature to them um and it, I, I love cycling or walking along there um always get the chance to whenever i do but you know, if, it, if it had just been concrete walls that zigzag ground it would be terrifying and it would be you know grim place that no one would go to and, and then bad behavior would ensue um so i i think that it's a really there's something so inherently um wrong <laughs> i mean yeah i'm somewhat repeating it's just um uh, it, my my only hope is it, it it's so it's so clearly wrong 
so clearly failed that there's not much time you know to perpetuate this mistake and it, the, the the environmentalist sort of agenda in some ways kind of well okay now you're paying attention yes traditionalists have been building environmentally by kind of default anyway you know of course that's just our inherent nature which is another scrutin uh, philosophy you know that the the, the the genuine genuine campaigner of the green movement it should be a conservative you know as in someone who you know we cherish things that we love you know and we want to preserve things we don't want to destroy things um uh, yeah, but we yeah. uh, we want to do it pragmatically and um in tune with with the wisdom that's been handed down to us rather than uh try to sort of yeah, unnecessarily reinvent something or it's, it's the height of arrogance isn't it as well to to tear everything down and start anew which well, yeah, is basically I mean, what Paul here with his area planning yeah i mean but again that's another one of the problems it, it's like the obsession with original and the new and uh you know uh, it means you you've got this inbuilt kind of rejection of accepting a lesson this works you know a pitch roof works which it, yeah. it's a, a funny a funny thing that i i've noticed over the last um well it's probably been longer than uh sort of five years but you know, definitely you know, 10 years the the return of the pitch roof um and but it's a pitch roof without eaves and it's um there's always then a window that follows the the gable uh, sort of triangular window and it and it it looks like a a, a cad you know 3d modeled a block with some you know triangular shapes popped out and then maybe the the roof tiles continue down the side of the building so it's got a monolithic look but it's 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 like they suddenly realized you know begrudgingly the flat roof is a, a, a ridiculous thing and um especially you know, in a in a wet climate yeah. and, and a picture roof makes perfect sense um um so this yeah but they can't quite just do a normal pitch roof with an eaves and you know clay tiles it has to be uh you know metal clad and uh you know inset gutters and stuff <laughs> yeah just um just a couple more notes on uh these uh, skyscrapers we found all around the world so it offers a uh, rootedness um something something that the vernacular architecture is something that is material and real and can be touched but also the spatial layout and construction of a vernacular building often reveals abstract concepts about an ethnic group's religious beliefs and values which in turn is often underpinned by its own mythos as well as more practical concerns such as climate so and we'll mm. see that in some of the the buildings throughout the series and we'll see that in like episode one in like the the barley curing yeah yeah and then I, just uh one more thing on uh the value of um vernacular architecture is um it it, it offers it's a particularist view of the world so it's a, it's a particularist particularist view of the world instead of universal so but you know things like these skyscrapers uh, symbolize universalism and global homogeneity whereas i'd say with a vernacular architecture is often the opposite of that and then just um a few thoughts on the, the skyscrapers we found around the world in the uh, dr shivago so in the film dr shivago he's um He's, he's a, a doctor who was um, a famous poet in uh, Russia, and um, it, the he's it, in the film. It's set uh, during the communist revolution, and um, and he gets uh, muddled up in it, Doctor Shivago. And um, if you've ever seen the film, it's a cracking film, and uh, it, it's what, along with um, Solzhenitsyn, it's probably one of the best critiques of communism in that. Um, because it, because because of Doctor Shivago's uh, poetry, he's uh, he's a romantic, and uh, he, he his poetry doesn't express, you know, it has nothing to do with you know communism or supporting Bolshevism, and it's uh, although it doesn't express 
uh, you don't um, see any of his uh, poetry in the film. He often you get a sense of uh, like he's a romantic in his view of the world. He always sees like the beauty and even the most direst situation. And he's in quite a lot of dire situations in that film. And he he comes up against uh, the authorities quite a lot, a lot of times, and they they hate his uh, his poetry. You know, they um, like Tom Courtney's character. You know, he's in that film. Is you know, he's 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 a, a, bureau, a Bolshevik bureaucrat who who just has a materialist conception of the world, and he denounces Chivago's poetry. You know, because with with him, it's it's nothing but you know, communism is everything. You know. And uh, so you have, you know, there's no room for man to express his own internal feelings. And but in its own way, I think it. it so with communism, you have this materialist uh, philosophy, which it sort of bulldozes everything. In its way, I, I, like the the managerial capitalism we have in the West, and we've had since at least forty five, maybe going back to nineteen. 14 or or 1912 when um you know we we brought in the welfare state i think um the, the managerial capitalism we're living under now is very similar in terms of it, you it, it, it's it's very materialist uh, philosophy and i think uh, aa did a good a video on this in how on how essentially like, essentially uh like a communist and a a free marketeer, the biggest disagreement generally is on um, the means to which uh, we can, uh, the best way to have an economy which uh, provides for the material needs of people, you know, whereas, say, the communist might come up with the idea of building, you know, the skyscraper or the tower block, but then the capitalists will go ahead and they'll build it more efficiently, you know, cheaper, more efficiently, and you'll see that in our, you know, in our major cities all across the world. And with that, I don't think if you, I don't think this is a fruitful way for humans to live long term in these uh, skyscrapers and tower blocks. And I think yeah. this will kill any romantic way of looking at the world. And I, I don't, I wonder how, in the future, like environments such as this will. What will they do to our creative class? Actually, you know, our, our writers and our poets and artists, architects, filmmakers, etc. Um, well, uh, yeah. I, I think I think there there'll be a growing uh, desire to find to find something authentic, find something that's you know, it's not necessarily profound in any way, but just r raw and real and um, and and uh, engaged with. Uh, uh, fundamentals of being human and and yeah um yeah uh, you got me thinking there about um some of the things that you were saying as well that it, you know if you walked into uh you know a vernacular village where right, you know it's a place that's that's filled with vernacular architecture yeah. without without knowing anything about where you are you'll be able to gain like glean little bits of information about the, the community, the the people that is there, uh, and their their what they value, what they uh, you know what they're like, um, you know maybe not so sort of definitively, but you'll just start to get an idea, and it's there'll be a you know a sense of um, a genuine you know identity of something. Whereas the the even though the the modern cities. Um, have a homogen, hom homogenous nature to them. They're 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 so fragmented and so you know, you, um, you 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 could walk through a city, um, even like an American city, and just what what does this place believe in? What does what are the what is this people? You know, what are these people? If you had no clue about it, and it um, th th yeah, that it's it's another symptom of this sort of fragmentation and the, the i think aa put it really well as well recently of that sort of denial the the denial of something the denial of a sense of 
um, <clears throat> of belonging to uh, a uh, you know a part to, of the world you know, to a to a place and, and a, a a legacy of something you know, a, a group of people that have a clear identity um you know you 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 know you know you don't come from anywhere you don't belong to anywhere you don't belong to any you know um and that so you know there's there's nothing there's no truth there's no um nothing to to stand on and and i think that the absence of that you know i think you know creates all the sorts of ills that we have today but um you know i i think <clears throat> that that will nurture uh, you know, people to desire something uh authentic something real um uh you know and i i, I do think there's in, in my my world of um knowing of you know, traditional architectural practices and stuff it is interesting to see um there is seemingly a growing number of young people um interested in traditional architecture to you know in engaging with this you know this the legacy of um you know of our um, ancestors um uh, and i i kind of hope that that might be the start of something bigger bigger because you know, what is on offer by the sort of modernist route in architecture is so unfulfilling and uh you know, in all senses of so professionally and personally and, and 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 then in the grander scheme of kind of the architectural legacy um it's um you know friends of mine that work in london uh doing big developments there it's just another you know uh sort of uh, big speculative housing thing or you know like a high rise uh, flat blocks and they'll you know they're huge and hundreds of millions of pounds they'll spend years or, or you know, a friend of mine's worked at a place for two two and a half years if not longer and he's only worked on one project um it's you know um i think um but yeah but there also there's an issue that you know if you have had a fairly you know if you're not really exposed to these things if you're whipped up by your university lecturer um at architecture uh, it, you you have to be pretty firm willed to um go against the indoctrination that you'll you'll be put under um it, you know to start bringing up roger scruton or uh quinlan terry or robert adam um you'll be shot down in flames um you know probably could get away with a bit of um as i say sort of uh, fetishized uh, vernacular architecture but um anything overtly traditional would uh, not go down well with most tutors um so I, yeah i think it's important to try and um show that there is a there is a way out and i think that a lot of people will be drawn to it drawn to practicing you know uh rediscovering these lost lessons uh, these lost knowledge yeah definitely yeah definitely uh yeah i think there'll be a backlash against it and i think um people will um yeah embrace uh ways of building hopefully which are more more organic um and uh, fitting well with the site and the the context. Yeah. So just um, a few a few quotes um, just I thought were quite helpful. Um, so Frank Lloyd Wright says the mother art is architecture. Without an architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. Um, and I think that's true of like the skyscrapers we've just uh, shown you. And then uh, this is, a, I think, a good one from Aldo Van Eyck. Um, he says, whatever space and time mean, place and occasion mean more. For space in the image of man is place, and time in the image of man is occasion. So, so some context for that quote, Aldo Van Eyck is talking about, um, he's reacting against Le Corbusier and Siegfried Gideon you know, Siegfried Gideon had a, a famous uh, modernist a book called Space, Time and Architecture. And um, he, I think he dedicated the most amount of space in that book to Le Corbusier. And 
you know, Lake Corbusier was all, you know, very, very abstract, especially in his urban planning. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any, no sense of place and occasion in, in his urban planning. And, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good quote, that one, I think. And then Wang Shu said, only people who understand the nature of materials can make art using the materials. And as I said earlier, he um, is a Chinese architect and he, he makes his uh, students uh, learn a, a craft such as bricklaying or carpentry in their first year of mm. uh, studying architecture, which is, I think, a really good idea. And I think... Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Something we should do well, here, to be honest. Well, well, it 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 was done. You know, it's it's, it's another one of these things. It's it, it was part of part of a course, um, but um, you know, it's expensive, takes up a lot of space. It's also probably not very inclusive. Um, you know, it's messy. Yeah. Um, it's hard work. Um, so yeah, I but I, I mean, this this is a another a, a, one of my my sort of theories and, and concerns is is picking up on that very point is is the the digitization of of uh, design um yeah. in, 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 you know, obviously in architecture now it's um but it, it it's picked up a pace in more recent years as you've got more software that's you know that you you know you won't ever sketch you know, hand hand and a pencil um you'll you'll use sketchup or you'll use a 3d other 3d software and rhino and then you'd have a plug-in uh yeah. you know we the big thing when i was at university was you know uh, grasshopper and that grasshopper, creates yeah. you know creates all these you know you it's it, it fundamentally it's it's not a drawing you know it's not a a tool in the sense of modeling anything you it's a it's a piece of programming you set parameters and uh, uh, an order or a process in order uh, you know to determine a form to do calculations that would be so complicated to do yourself um that you create all these ripply undulating surfaces and it can you know, uh, quickly produce all the ge ge geometry in order for then another piece of computer controlled equipment to you know, manufacture it um and you know I, my time at university studying architecture you know it, it was an awful lot of people that did incredibly well would just chain themselves to a computer become incredibly good at um photoshop and rhino and producing these incredible renders um but they had no sense of what it was like to dig a hole in muddy clay in thick wet clay on a you know winter's day and then pour concrete um you know uh how you know f you know fit a, a timber frame into a, a masonry opening and you know you know what that all is that's you know what all these you know the you know resistant and uh you know challenging materials and um i i think that that disconnect well yeah so the, uh, uh i think that leads in my mind in my understanding to different a different mindset a different type of person um being successful and studying therefore being drawn into the profession yeah. the person that that picks it's up a pencil and, yeah well, yeah well well someone that, will, that picks up a pencil and goes out and sketches sketches buildings or does life drawing or just you know it is once it's it's a hand eye direct you know that is a certain type of thinking yeah. Someone that is programming and doing drop-down menus and filling in numbers and parameters, and is is uh, you know just sat in a you know seat you know clicking a mouse, it, it, which sadly you know, we all kind of have to do, um, even if we don't want to do it all the time. It's a completely different way of thinking. It's a different type of personality, almost. I'd say it's a different uh, brain. And therefore, the type of architecture that that person will produce is going to be completely different to the the, the person that's been an architect up until you know, twenty years ago. Um, that, that could produce uh, all their drawings by hand and and understand. You know, they could they didn't have a three D software where they could quickly model something up. They had to understand it 
in their mind. So they had to have the right sort of mental uh, 3D visualizing in their mind, not yeah. you know, not uh, magic it up on a computer. Um, uh, so I think that's a that's a really interesting quote that I think is is becoming is being completely kind of violated in more of a fundamental sense uh, than just not actually engage you know having a go at laying a brick wall yeah i think he makes a um a great point in his book uh what's his name uh you yohani plasma he makes a great point in his book i think and when he talks about uh like how someone who's designed a building primarily through uh drawing and making handmade models they generally have he, more often than not they have a better understanding a more intimate knowledge of their building than someone who's designed it purely from a computer um, yeah and yeah they're more connected with the design process and um and things such as the use of grasshopper or maya to uh to you know build these um often generic buildings yeah, with, with the mouse as well it's often you're just spitting out a building, you know, there's everybody clicks the mouse in the same manner, you know, as where someone who's drawing or sketching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's you're, often you're an, there's an individual hand, you know, an individual touch. You yeah. Well, the, well, the individual yeah. human hand on that. that exactly. drawing, and, then, and then that building eventually, you know, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, uh, so many buildings now will be, you know, uh, 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 all the, you know, if, this would mean nothing to most people, but you know, if you're using a software like Rhino, it will be uh, extrusions of blocks, and then you have all these Boolean functions, um, and that's that's sort of this sort of you know you overlap forms and and you know, uh, uh, delete the overlap or the intersection or whatever it is, and you you and and then you push and pull this form, and it it calls upon. A very particular way of working and thinking and uh, when I, I used to use it where I used to work um, and it what took me a while to get my head around is just like how to start building this model um, and it, it forced you down a particular way uh, I never particularly yeah. enjoyed working with it but um, uh, yeah I, uh, but you yeah, know but um, what's frustrating though is what I find frustrating is you know I think um, you know drawing hand drawing is uh, it requires perseverance and many hundreds of hours of just doing it and doing it and uh, keep you know um, building up experience of it um, and it's so difficult to to get that now you know with um, the great architects that we look back on you know would have been a draftsman in their late teens probably um, copying or you know doing additional uh, you know, plans, copying plans for um, of, of great ar ar other architects or, or just yeah. other architects, and they'd have built up this sort of knowledge that sort of almost in muscle memory of of how to draw and how to you know um, understand a plan and how to understand these things. Whereas how to draw a shadow on a column. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like exactly. Well, you just then if you're doing it every day, you're just constantly doing it, and you're looking at great work you're it becomes second nature you know that, yeah. and i think i think yeah that's a I, I think that's why one of the reasons maybe why we don't have um kind of great artists and, and architects anymore because you know no one's no one's being whisked off to become an apprentice at 14 anymore and um you know but you know i i feel like maybe we're getting slightly off topic there but i think there's but yeah, yeah it's right, in interesting a, uh, it's an interesting nonetheless, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I could, could uh, go on about that for hours. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But yeah, that, yeah, that's a great point you make. Um, so just, um, just one more quote before we go into the uh, yeah, the uh, buildings on Asia and. Um, Funnily enough, it is from uh, Mies van der Rohe, funnily enough. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd expect it from Frank Lloyd Wright, but this one, funnily enough, is from Mises. Uh, so Mises says, where can we find greater structural 
clarity than in the wooden buildings of old. Where else can we find such unity of material, construction and form? Here the wisdom of whole generations is stored. What feeling for material and what power of expression there is in these buildings? What warmth and beauty they have. They seem to be echoes of old songs and buildings of stone as well. What clear understanding of the material, how surely it is joined, what sense they had of where stone could and could not be used. Where do we find such wealth of structure? Where more natural and healthy beauty? How easily they laid beamed ceilings on their old stone walls and with what sensitive feeling they cut doorways through them. What better examples could there be for young architects? Where else could they learn such simple and true crafts than from these unknown masters? We can also learn from brick. How sensible is this small handy shape so useful for every purpose? What logic in its bonding, pattern and texture? What richness in the simplest wall surface? But what discipline this material imposes? Thus each material has its specific characteristics which we must understand if we want to use it. This is no less true of steel and glass. So, yeah, that's... Um, Funnily enough, a good quote there from Mies van der Rose. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, very controversial figure, to say the least. He, uh, you'd expect something like that to be said by Frank Lloyd Wright, but apparently he didn't have... Um, he did, apparently Frank Lloyd Wright didn't hold the vernacular in high regard. Well, well yeah, yeah, I guess it does come back to seeing the vernacular as a sort of a primitive, um, maybe... Um, uh, again, it, you know, vernacular has this broad spectrum. Um, I, I mean, I, I kind of agree with everything he was saying, apart from his final statement there. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, <laughs> this is the last two I, I mean, it, less, Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like what? How can how can you have? You know, this uh, is a, a, a funny thing yeah. about so many modernists that it's like how can you think that and then say that? Um, and I, it's almost a. Uh, you know, if you want to be a bit more conspiratorial, maybe you know, you know they're they're doing one thing when thinking another. Um, you know, uh, I think yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of famous modern architects. Uh, you know, it's interesting to see where they live, <laughs> um, yeah. the actual properties they choose to live in. Um, yeah, I think what Mies is um, the Barcelona Pavilion is such a beautiful building, but um, yeah, a lot of his steel and glass buildings, the skyscrapers, and yeah, the, the very cold, well, get, like, get yeah, often I, very sterile. I, I you know, I, but um, I, I mean, a bit like your your thumbnail of the the um, falling water, Frank Lloyd Wright writes. It's like where, where I guess I I'm not a complete. You know, I I, I studied you know art before, and I have uh, you know I do love quite a bit of twentieth century art, and I, I think the where where on a on a sort of an aesthetic front that sort of very subtle gesture uh, or you know of a few elements um can be um quite powerful quite you know but you know like the the barcelona pavilion um when i went there you know it, it you know, you really get that homing in on the statue in at the back um yeah you know, the building is sort of guiding you to it um Yeah, it's an interesting. He's got like a classical statue. It's almost like a yeah. He's um. I think with that building, he's definitely trying to um. Combine uh, like the classical with the modern. Um, uh, I guess Louis Louis can try to do that to combine the classical with the modern, as well. Um, uh, yeah, well, they, they, you start to get into postmodern stuff, and uh, um, yeah, that's a whole other debate and world, I guess, or discussion. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll move on to um, the first building, the issue of Jingle Shrine, because I'm sure we could, uh, you know, talk about uh, <laughs> modernism, <laughs> the ills of modernism for uh, yeah, yeah. forever and ever, but. Um, yeah, we'll move on to the issue of Jingle Shrine and uh, for that building, I um, thought it'd be good to show you guys watching at home a, a video on, on YouTube, which is six minutes long on the issue of Jingle Shrine. I think it gives a good uh, overview of the building itself.
Can everyone see that? Can you hear that, Gilly? Oh, no, I can't hear it. All oh, right. Can you hear it now? Mm, oh, no. Uh, do you have to like, share audio or something? Um, sure. Is that one of the... If you stop sharing your screen and then when you reshare it, do you? Uh, that seems to be a common thing. Is there like a share audio or share with share audio? Screen, share video. No. So can you hear this now, Gilly? So, oh, yes, yeah. Have you ever been to Isajingu? Yes, I have, and I have. Um, so, so I'll just play this from the beginning. So, yeah. Have you ever been to Isajingu? Yes, I have, and I found it to be a very spiritual experience. I agree. Mm. He says an awesome place. Yes. I also enjoyed walking around the um, Okage Yokocho Street where there are many reconstructions of traditional buildings associated with the Ise pilgrimage. Oh, yes, I've mm. been there too. Yeah. I like the speciality sweet rice cakes that have been refreshing visitors to Ise for 300 years. Ah, yes. A cluster of buildings nestling in a vast expanse of forest. This is the inner shrine of Ise Jingu. Located in Mie Prefecture, Ise Jingu is one of the most important shrines in all of Japan. The grounds of the inner shrine are covered with cedar and cypress trees that are over 300 years old and have been left untouched to this day. To reach the main shrine buildings, visitors have to walk along the approach which is more than one kilometer long. Enshrined here is Amaterasu Omikami, the sun deity who appears in Japanese mythology. The outer shrine was built to form a pair with the inner shrine. These two shrines and 123 other affiliated shrines in the vicinity are collectively known as Ise Jingu. It's said that Ise Jingu was founded about 2,000 years ago. Amaterasu Omikami is considered the tutelary deity of the imperial family. So Ise Jingu became an object of fervent worship for many aristocrats and warriors. From the 17th century, the religious admiration for Ise Jingu spread to the common people, and there were repeated pilgrimage booms. It's even recorded that in one year, around 10% of the country's population visited Ise Jingu. Ise Jingu is closely associated with Japan's culture of rice cultivation. This is evident in the Kanna Mesai ritual, held every year in October. Kanna Mesai is one of the annual events held by the imperial family. Offerings of the year's first harvest of rice are made to Ise Jingu as an expression of thanks for yet another bountiful year. The special architectural style of Ise Jingu also reveals its link to rice cultivation. The buildings are supposedly modelled on rice granaries from the Yayoi period, the time when rice cultivation began in Japan. The pillars and walls are made of unpainted wood, and the roofs are thatched. Built in a very austere manner, these structures deteriorate over time. In order to keep them looking good, each building is regularly rebuilt in exactly the same form on the adjacent plot of land and the deity is transferred into the new hall. Carried out every 20 years, this is called Shikinen Sengu. It's believed that Shikinen Sengu restores the power of the deity. At Ise Jingu, it has been conducted regularly for centuries, and that's why its ancient architectural style has been perfectly preserved to this day. Ise Jingu has been a place of worship since ancient times. 
its close association with Japanese culture is apparent from the buildings and customs that have been carefully maintained. Stuart, mm. what most impressed you? Well, it's that extraordinary idea of replacing the buildings every 20 years. Um, what happens to the old structures? Well, the timber is sent all over Japan to mm. affiliated shrines to be reused. Oh, so it's an interesting example of a historical recycling scheme. Yes, it is. Mm. I know you enjoy visiting old European churches and cathedrals. Yes. How do they compare with somewhere like Isejingu? Well, um, Christian edifices are rather different. Sometimes the surroundings are pleasant, although usually there is a graveyard. But the spiritual atmosphere is inside the buildings, and you are very much in the presence of one God. Uh, well, uh, in the case of a major shrine, the whole place has a very spiritual atmosphere, yes. usually surrounded by wonderful trees, and you can feel you are in the presence of many gods. Mm. But foreigners are always surprised that there's nothing much to see when you reach the most sacred buildings. In European churches, there's so much to see and do inside. Mm -hmm. Lots of historical items and uh, memorials and... Uh, church services, concerts, tea rooms, even shops, uh, and so on. Ah, in the case of shrines, I usually can't go inside the main mm, buildings mm, mm, except mm. for uh, special ceremonies. Yes, uh, that's an interesting difference. Mm -hmm. Hiro, can I ask you about the um, pilgrimages to Issei in the Edo period? Yes. Were they as much about the journey as the destination? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, religious associations called Oiseko mm. were founded all across the country. A pilgrimage cost a lot, so people pitched in money through the Oiseko, mm. and members traveled to Ise in turn. Uh -huh. In a way, uh, the Oiseko were an early form of travel agency mm. organizing Ise pilgrimage uh, package tours. Oh, so that was well before Thomas Cook? Yes, that's right. Uh, thanks to Cook, travel by rail to the seaside mm -hmm. became popular in Britain. So many big resorts uh, developed in the 19th century. Was mm -hmm. there something similar here? Uh, yes, uh, but a bit later. Mm. In the early 20th century, many railway lines were extended to famous uh, shrine and temple towns. Mm. Uh, you could say that Japan's modern tourist industry started as an extension of pilgrimage. So the Japanese wanted to visit shrines and temples, and we wanted to go to the seaside. That's right. Oh, wow, that's a very interesting difference, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Of course. <laughs> Hilariously scripted. <laughs> <laughs> Had the feel of like, uh, like uh, a training day video. You know? yeah, yes, exactly. You know, when you're at school or something, it's... <laughs> <laughs> and I just yeah the the, uh, the the Englishman's wearing this crazy pink shirt and tie, and then the Japanese guy seems to be wearing like a like a morning suit almost. Um, <laughs> this grey waistcoat. <laughs> um, um, yeah, very yeah, very uh, interesting. Um, I I think uh, uh, without sounding too cynical or anything, you know. Um, one thing that does I can't help but wonder with it is what has changed. It, uh, you know, it might it might um, it might be rebuilt every twenty years, but inherently something creeps in. You know, um, uh, and I mean, I ha I can spot already there is a, um, a what looks like a corrugated corrugated. Uh, iron roof or a you know, metal roof on the left there yeah um uh you know like is there is there any you know, variation to some of the techniques that they use or presumably they now use power tools and do they or do they you know maybe that's part of the ritual of it that they don't yeah. um uh but, um I, yeah, I, I, I was just curious just curious um uh, I, pres it, I presume they, they still uh, 
use the same materials, you know, the same methods they would have done uh, like 1,200, um, yeah. 60 years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's um, interesting uh, how the shrine is, you know, the, like the most important shrine in Japan and how it seems to be, you know, tied to the culture of Japan and um, how many people used to, you know, go visit it as well. You know, take a pilgrimage back in the day before, you know, mechanised transport as yeah. well. Um, yeah, how interesting, yeah, you know, it's deeply tied to its culture. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think um, ch trying to sort of consider it, you know, it, it's, it's sort of vernacular legacy or, you know, it's vernacular state is, you know, it, as, as it was pointed out, it's had this quite exceptional kind of, uh, you know, uh, free, freezing in time, um, even though it's a new structure, it's, you know, um, it, it, it fundamentally is presumably, uh, you know, it is what was there um, a thousand years ago. Um, uh, so, I mean, the thing with vernacular architecture, it, it, it's that constant conversation. It's, you know, it's like, I, I've, I've built my roof this way. Oh, I've built it this way. Or I've just, you know, gone to the, the you know, got, gone on a little travel and I noticed they, they do it slightly differently and it's slightly more efficient and you don't have to use quite so much wood. Um, and, and so there's that constant refinement, constant, um, you know, um, uh, evolution, I guess. Whereas this, as much as this has clearly come out of a tradition like that, it's then been stopped. Um, and so it's given us that look into the past, um, uh, but, um, but, but not allowed to continue. I, I guess it's, I guess it's lucky that it hasn't been allowed to architecturally, you know, sort of evolve over the generations because now it would be, <laughs> what, what would, you know, if this was like a, a, a competition held every 20 years for an architect to design the new, uh, temple, um, you know that um it, it it would have a well um even if they tried to maintain some some legacy it, it would end up yeah yeah well it, it, no longer having the unique or well obviously um state that this is um but it yeah it's curious i think I, I was mentioning before we came on um like how is this specifically like japanese and specifically to that region you know, what is it i there obviously i didn't know about the the fact that it was like a grain uh rice store like a like a traditional uh presumably like a barn or almost of um but it has a very japanese feel it's a i think a little bit like the proportions of it, maybe a slightly the spacing of the columns. Um, it's, it's intimately tied to the Japanese royal family as well. I think. Yeah, but like, but you, I guess, I, I mean, I, I guess if, if you hadn't told me where this was, I, you know, I mean, I know, I know the structure, but the building. But if you yeah. had, if, if like, if you, you, know, you just know there has just, just by looking at it, you couldn't tell that it's you wouldn't necessarily. Well, Be able uh, to tell it was Japanese. Well, like could could you or couldn't you? I, I guess I feel yeah. like I feel like it is Japanese. I feel like I, but I can't quite say why. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess maybe if you did send it to someone who had a little bit of an understanding, they might say it's Chinese, controversially, yeah. or uh, <clears throat> or maybe they could sort of roughly gauge it. But then, oh, you know, that, what, that's an interesting thing actually. Like if you were to show people. Like a, a random hundred people, this photo, like how many would guess it was Japanese? How, you know, how, how many would know that it was Japanese? And yeah, and how many would, yeah. wouldn't know? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think to myself, like, do you know? Why do I think it's? You know, why do I think it has a Japanese feel to it? You know, why? Um, is it just because I know that it is Japanese? Um, uh, or, or is there? You know, as I say, like just a, a particular sensibility of the use and the arrangement, the composition. Um, I mean, the most striking thing is the ridge detailing. Um, 
uh, um, you know, the the slightly suspended um, pitch roof that sort of yeah. just hang, hangs, sort of can or well, it doesn't quite, yeah, just sort of hangs there. And um, yeah, it, um, as, as he was saying in in the talk, it, you know, it's it's quite the the internal space doesn't. It's not a box. It's got the balcony. It's got the terrace. The the the, the sort of colonnade almost. Uh, and the, the stairway and the entrance is all open. Uh, so I, I think my my sort of little bit of knowledge on Japanese architecture that that slight the um, blurring of of where the inside and outside begins um, it, um, seems to be quite characterfully Japanese and um, and it, and it's also under sort of even though it is. A, a very striking form it's it's understated in its finer details um it's not super uh you know again as they men yeah. mentioned it it's not it, super it, embellished it, and elaborated it does tend to have that um aspect to it doesn't it traditional japanese architecture is uh, understated yeah yeah well that, that's sort of that is quite inherent in their the cultural aesthetics um uh i think i can sort of see a parallel to like their clothing you know their clothing had that very broad shouldered but very plain uh gowns and it's like this house this sorry this temple this shrine it's got this very broad uh pitched roof but then it's actually quite modest you know there's no uh you know this this great the great column in the center it's not it's not painted it, it's not as they said it's not embellished it's not engraved it's uh it, you know there's not like some grand capital or uh, uh you know um a, a, um sort of sculptural moments of it 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 it's focused and it's different sort of quite confidently uh so sort of singular in its in what it it's trying to, it, it, in its um architectural forms I mean, you could say, you know, a modernist, a sort of a clean modernist would really like this. You know, it's, it's very um, restrained. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely. That is, that is a, a word you sort of associate with Japanese architecture is restrained. Yeah. Um, I've got this, um, uh, I think, illuminating passage from a... Uh, Colin Davis's book, um, uh, Thinking About Architecture, An Introduction to Architectural Theory. In, in this book by Colin Davis, he's got a, a chapter on form. Um, I'll just read out a passageway from it, which I think is quite illuminating. So at the beginning of his chapter on form, Colin Davis states the following, quote, form and matter, the shape of a thing and the material that it's made of are inseparable companions. Everything that physically exists at both for everything that physically exists has both form and matter. Even a formless mass has some kind of form, like a cloud or a heap, and form devoid of matter is a mere ghost or apparition. So why do we in language and thought persistently treat form and matter as if it were possible to separate them? This is a question that has troubled philosophers for thousands of years. For Plato, the distinction between form and matter was connected with thinking itself. One place that form might exist without matter is in the human mind. When we think of a cat or a tree, we form these objects in our mind and perhaps we even see them with the mind's eye, even though they contain no matter. Plato elevated form to the status of, status of the divine by thinking of it as existing in the mind of God or of the demiurge that he imagined as the creator of the world. Form for Plato was therefore more important than matter because it was eternal and unchanging. The form of a cat will always exist, he thought, whereas the matter of which a particular cat is made will soon be disappearing into the earth and taking some other form. So his idea was that each individual materially constituted cat was really just a passing reflection on earth of an ideal celestial eternal cat 
existing in the mind of God. Aristotle didn't think it necessary to postulate ideal forms. For him, it was enough to observe that form obviously, in some sense, existed in the real world, even if it was inseparable from matter. Aristotle's version of form was not eternal and unchanging, but constantly in motion like matter. He argued that thought that the form that comes to mind when we think of a cat only represents that cat at one stage in its life. It has also been an embryo in its mother's womb and it will eventually be a pile of bones. Aristotle saw both form and matter as dynamic. They were two of the driving forces behind a changing but purposeful world. He included them in what has become known as his doctrine of the four causes. The other two types of cause being the efficient cause, which means the active agent that makes something happen. This is the type of cause to which we most often apply our modern word cause. And the final cause, which means the underlying purpose of an object or an event. So, for example, the formal cause of a house would be the architect's design. The material cause would be the bricks and mortar. The efficient cause would be the builder. And the final cause would be the function of the house as a place to live in. But the important thing from our point of view is that Aristotle not only accepted the unreal distinction between form and matter, he reinforced it by making it an essential part of his model of the world. Modern, modern concepts like Darwinian evolution have superseded Plato's and Aristotle's ideas about the way the world works. But even Darwin couldn't help talking about form and matter as if they were separable. It is an idea lodged unshakably in our language and thought, and it is an idea central to architectural theory. As designers of objects to be made, architects deal fundamentally with the relationship between form and matter. The Naiku Shrine at Ise in Japan provides a, shrike, a striking illustration of this relationship. The shrine is important for lots of reasons. It is the Shinto religion's most sacred site, and it is built in an architectural style known as Shinme Izikuru, which is reserved specially for it. But it is the regular ritual renewal of the shrine that illuminates the question of form and matter. Every 20 years, the building is dismantled and reassembled on an adjacent site. It oscillates, as it were, between its two sites on a 20 year frequency. This has so far happened 61 times since the building of the first shrine in the 7th century. So how many buildings are there? One or two or 62? Where is the real building? On site A or site B? And how old is it really? 12 years or 1200 years? The only way to answer these questions sensibly is to separate form from matter. The form with its raised floor, encircling veranda and simple double pitched roof is ancient. The matter wooden thatch is new. There is a cultural difference here between Japanese and Western attitudes to the preservation of important buildings. In 19th century England, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings fought against the wholesale restoration of medieval churches in which original ornament was replaced by modern imitations. The members of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings valued the old stones themselves. Matter was as important to them as form. But in Japan, as we have seen, matter is relatively unimportant. Its transience is accepted, whereas form is preserved at all costs. So I thought that was just an interesting uh, passage. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that's a, a a really interesting point about. Um, I've I've gone al I've gone along to an event run by um, uh, a, a Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings. They were restoring an old, an old um, uh, sort of uh, it was like a, a shrine on a the pilgrimage down to Canterbury, and um, they were obsessed. I, I I don't know quite how I feel about this either way, but um, I was just struck by how obsessed they were that any repair that they did to this building had to be branded, you know, to say uh, their sap logo and and the year you know 2020 or whatever it was um so so the future uh historian or archaeologist or architect or whoever would be able to come along and go ah 
that piece of timber is original or is from you know 200 years ago but that piece of timber is only from you know 10 years ago or 50 years ago um and uh i, I yeah i found it a weird i guess what i i'd say is awkward about that is and th this is a kind of really interesting point actually on like it's kind of touching upon the difference between a living culture so this shrine is is really it's living still it's still living it's still you know they do it every you know they have their their, their celebrations there and they do this every 20 years whereas you know the monastery or or in some ways even you know to my uh, to the to my uh, immense disappointment or shame is, is you know churches and stuff are sort of losing that ritual and but they might still be valued but as a sort of uh curiosity um and i so that that touches on that sort of cultural living your know, what is the architecture responding to and, you know do we you know I, I do love that that kind of connection with the past when you actually hold or touch something that is genuinely hundreds of years old or older yeah um but then also you know as a you know as a traditionalist uh, you know as i'm a you know, traditionalist architect i I don't I don't want to just build with old stones or something but I I want to Im embody and continue this sort of cultural um legacy somehow yeah. um but I want it to be alive I don't want it just to be um you know um just doing uh, it for the sake of it well as a sort of yeah. preservation sort of curiosity cabinet thing yeah. which is maybe what this uh, society of protection of ancient buildings um which I think was founded by Pugin, um, uh, I think, or maybe or, or maybe Rushkin, but um, uh, it, it, but I I kind of don't know quite which side I a, a little bit of both there, but I, I think there's um, it, there's something quite compelling about the the living nature of this cultural this the building and the cultural tradition of it um, that's maybe lost in um, Part, parts of our our ancient buildings um where they they may be fully you know largely intact but there isn't that you know the life that should be going through them the the, the services and the rituals and you know i hate the fact that um uh you know choirs and stuff in, in english cathedrals have been stopped uh, uh, because of the pandemic and yeah, yeah um, it's awful. you know it's like we have such a great tradition of um choral uh, music and you know the uh, even song and stuff that um that just is this gentle it's going on all the time in our uh, cathedral cities um uh, but then uh, that's sort of you know, been stopped and you know uh sort of uh, yeah it's that's where i feel like a cathedral in this country comes alive and you walk in and there's music and and yeah. ritual and and service and worship and stuff not not just uh tourists with cameras yeah uh the, it seems like the gregorian chant as well mm. seems to be ideal for the 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 old church an old church and it would be stone um with yeah stone and that and uh read recently read um um steenie allen ralph Nelson's experience in architecture and it's interesting he makes the point in his chapter on hearing and architecture on how like uh, the Gregorian chant it developed from the old, you know, stone churches that were built, and uh, you know the old stone basilicas, and how they got turned into um, churches, and how like the Gregorian chant grew out of the stone churches because it, it enabled uh, reverberation. Yeah, yeah. And then he contrasts that with um, uh, how Johann Sebastian's back. Uh, it backs music developed from I think wooden church that he was in that he um, yeah he, he, that he grew up around um, which didn't have that reverberation I think had two and a half seconds reverberation roughly whereas the old stone uh, churches had um, eight and a half eight and a half seconds of reverberation due to the stones yeah. that were used but um 
Yeah, just thought I'd mention that, but yeah, we're, we're getting off topic slightly, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think that's this does all kind of feed back into vernacular architecture because it's it isn't just. I mean, I, I would argue that maybe that you know, compared to something like classical architecture, where you can you know, we can sit here with slides of you know the the orders and uh, you know different mouldings and features and stuff that. It's it's that's you know, you could learn it. It's whereas va vernacular architecture is, it it, it is it, it, it's kind of a bit more um, broader. Uh, you know, it's it's you've got to understand so many different or so much more many more aspects to just get a grasp of it. Um, it's not just uh, well. That's kind of goes back to the point I was making. Uh, the this. Um, you know, how polite the architecture is becoming, how conscious it is in its design, how designed it is. Um, yeah. And uh, so you have to kind of look at other things to understand what's influencing the people and what's creating them, to, you know, making them build buildings and structures in this way. So, yeah, you have to draw upon broader topics, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, building to ponder this. This year, Jingo Shran and uh, that issue of uh, like form and architecture or permanence, as you know, the uh, guy brought up in the video. The issue of rebuilding this building um, every twenty years it it draws up um, interesting architectural uh, questions and then uh, philosophical questions as well. Yeah. So this uh, this right here is a photo of um, the the site of uh, the the Isi Grand Shrine. Um, I think it's called Naiku, the Naiku Shrine, um, and the site, um, as it was mentioned in the video, um, they rebuild uh, the the Naiku Shrine uh, every twenty years. On an adjacent uh, site, and um, this is what this photo shows. You know, every twenty years, the the shrine is uh, rebuilt on the adjacent site. Mm. And this is just um, elevation and uh, plan view of uh, the the Issy Grand Shrine, otherwise known as I think the Naiku Shrine. And then uh, this right oh, here yeah. is. Is an um, I don't know how you pronounce that Ikeo, uh, UK Ukayo is uh, an ancient Japanese art. So this is an Ikeo. You're depicting the the Sengu ceremony, uh, the relocation of Kami when it was rebuilt in 1849 by Hiroshigu. Hirosh Hiroshigu. So I, I think. Um, I think it says in the video as well about the the shrine being, you know, when it's uh, dis dissembled every twenty years, um, the wood is is sent to um, different shrines all across uh, Japan. So is that you or is that me, um, Gilly? What was that? I, I the um, I don't know. It was a bit. It's like fuzzy. Oh no! I uh, I couldn't hear it my end. So it may be my end. Ah, uh, but it stopped now, anyways. So um, that's good. So the next building we've got on the list to discuss is um. Indian step wells and step ponds in India. So, so a few notes I had on them were so my, my notes I've, I've got on them is um, that they're located, um, you mainly find them in India. Um, Step wells and step ponds can easily be found in the desert states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. So I think within India, they're mainly uh, step wells 
and step ponds are mainly found in those two states and they were constructed uh, due to seasonal fluctuations in the water supply in uh, arid regions of India. So states such as Gujarat and Rajasthan are dry for most of the year and apart from a few months of uh, torrential monsoon rain. For close to 2000 years, these architectural structures have provided uh, around the year supply of water for local inhabitants to use for drinking, bathing, irrigation and washing. Step wells and step ponds are constructed by excavating underground until the water level is reached. In Rajasthan and Gujarat, this can mean excavating until your you've you, until your ten or more stories underground. Once this was done, a stone lined trench construction with uh, steps down to the water uh, level was carefully placed where the excavated ground uh, used to be. Step wells uh, were usually temples themselves and step ponds were usually located next to temples. Step wells usually had columned pavilions on each landing. The steps led down to the water level and the Hindu uh, temple step wells usually had ornate carvings of deities, uh, humans and animal sculptures. Wealthy patrons such as royalty and merchants, merchants usually paid for the construction of step wells and step ponds as symbols of their generosity to the whole community. So yeah, that, that's my notes on them, on the Indian step wells and step ponds. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, trying to look something up there. But, um, I mean, it's 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 interesting that it's kind of as much as it's associated with uh, was it, was it uh, shrines or was it uh, tem temples? Did you say? Well, I, I missed uh, uh, at least a sort I of a, the, um, a, a spiritual element. Yeah. It's sort of fundamentally. Um, you know, it's infrastructure, it's uh, practical. Um, yeah. Um, um, and I just, I'm curious by those arches, like, um, yeah, they they just reminiscent of, it's quite a gothic form of a four-centered arch. They're slightly suppressed, um, uh, pointed arch. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh i don't i yeah i um and it almost looks like a uh, castellation or something at the end um it i yeah i'm just i'm just thinking of it um what you know what again that question again of like um can you what what can you tell is sort of distinct to its its location its culture and um um, it's always interesting the I mean you, whether it be you know the, the, just the inherent logic of similar structural forms um, structural systems and stuff but also like are, are they have they been influenced by um, you know the, just the, the passing on of knowledge and um, from other cultures um, and enveloped it into their own, um, and the, uh, the stonework. Um, yeah, the most. Uh, I, I guess um, to pick up on your point, I think it's an interesting point you make, and it it probably was the case. I imagine there was, um, you know, the the the, ma the stone masons and craftsmen had you know a cross pollination of uh, of ideas with you know. Um, with peoples who were, you know, local to them, or you know, just outside the towns and villages um, that they were in, you know. Yeah, but uh, like uh, I guess it's um, you know the uh, the you know the the um, cla you know, the origin of classical architecture was you know, so many thousands of years ago that there was enough time for it, you know, for traces of it to disseminate quite broadly and um, uh, and. Yeah, there, there, there's elements, 
potentially you know, elements of that um, or but i wonder yeah just i'm curious um how much is just uh maybe a coincidence or a, or or genuine influence um uh, but it, I, yeah the more i look at it and the more of you you know you the, the more i feel very unclear of like uh being able to you know, be, being able to tell um you know where it is or you know um more of the cultural clues within it it's um it's quite tricky um it, i mean it's it's function it's um i guess again it's quite tricky but it but once you start to know it it's it, it makes sense i'm curious to know where those doors lead um and i'd you know you know be amazed how it um looks sort of filled with water um if it you know if it ever did fill up partly at least um, yeah i believe um the step wells and step ponds um uh, um as i said they were you know they were the the ex they built them by you know excavating down uh into the ground so they could um you know until they reached the water level oh yeah you know, so it gave them an access to a water slap water supply the whole year round and then and then sometimes uh during like uh monsoon season during like when they had torrential uh rainfall sometimes you know the um the the step wells and the step ponds would actually fill up with water themselves to you know to the ground level mm. yeah i guess it helped to you know prevent uh would prevent it from you know draining away too quickly back into the the water core or the waterways um yeah it's uh, a fascinating curious place uh, yeah so I, had, I had a few more notes on it as well um so the these structures um played a big role in the life of the community as they were places people could go to drink wash bathe, uh, worship, or simply enjoy the beauty of their surroundings. Sacred rituals and special festivals also took place within these structures. In dry seasons, locals could go down the staircase in order to get access to water at the ground level. In rainy monsoon seasons, step wells and step ponds acted as large systems with the rainwater sometimes reaching uh, the ground level. Hmm. Step stepped ponds were less polluted than step wells and were easier to construct a lot of stepped ponds and step wells were filled in or destroyed under british rule as they regarded them as unsanitary places which breeded disease and then my last uh last note i had on these uh buildings where the hindus believed that purification uh, with water is an essential aspect of spiritual life and thus a daily bath cleanses your sins and is uh, the moment when one is closest to heaven interesting you know, it's, so, uh, yeah 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 it's, it's, it's interesting how these structures were like an intimate part of them um, you know their beliefs so you know it's an inter in these structures where like they seem to be like an integral part of their community life yeah uh, how you know it's it's not just water a water uh you know it's not just a well it's it, it it's uh it's so much more layered and uh um entwined in in their their cultural religious uh, uh rituals traditions and stuff um uh, uh i guess that's yeah that's a way of reinforcing it but then yeah it, it it's it, i guess i i guess it's making me think of you know uh, maybe another another way that we've kind of lost uh any sense of transcendent in uh in some of the the um you know what what is such a uh you know you you know fundamentally utilitarian thing to do they make um make it transcendent make it um more more than that um 
and then, and then you know, we, yeah, we yeah we probably just snicker at that or be rather bemused by that um, nowadays. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think most people would snigger at that. Um, like uh, trying yeah. to get at the the transcendent. Um, the I mean, like the old Gothic cathedrals are some of like our most revered pieces of, of yeah. architecture. Um, yeah. And I, I think um, that yeah, you know, whether, whatever station someone is in life you know whether they're an aristocrat or a working class person i think they, they know they get a sense when they look at um a gothic cathedral of that their ancestors built that and that it's a, an integral part of their civilization yeah yeah i i guess i uh, just thinking of of the the fact that it has this primarily a sort of a, you know a function to to to, to uh, perform um uh um it, it has, you know, um, has also made me think of um, the fact that we've rebuilt Battersea Power Station. Um, that that sort of become like a modern shrine or, or mo a modern, you know, um, is that the not, modern now? Is no, it? uh, it's the the one from the Pink Floyd album. You know, it's the the four towers. Um, uh, they because they the, the towers are cast concrete and they 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 because that so it was it was listed and protected and they were so decayed that they had to demolish them and then they rebuilt them so it, it's you know it slightly touches on that whole rebuilding um uh i i guess i'm just trying i'm just thinking of of that you know, <clears throat> maybe it's like um I'm, I'm, I'm imagine like back back in the days of the early industrial revolution um they probably would have been like a morning prayer or, or something before the weaving, you know, the weaving mach machines would start up before the mills start kicking in. They would have had that um, moment of uh, reflection or moment of uh, transcendental, you know, a tran trans uh, transcendental moment um, uh, or, or, you know, spiritual, you know, Christian moment. Um, uh, even though it was this sort of big industrial thing, um, I think uh, it, I think that's an uh, uh, that that combination. It's um, is maybe yeah. That's what I was I guess I was highlighting or, or kind of trying to work out what how we would respond to that um, today. Mm. Yes. Yeah. How, yeah. How would we connect to that transcendental? In in something quite you know like if if uh, I'm just thinking like if if we now kind of held like a little church service at a dam, you know, or a, a Rutland Water or something, a reservoir, you know, um, um, I guess most people would just be like, uh, you know, maybe a bit glib about it. It wouldn't be something that you'd, you know. Yeah, we, we've lost maybe that ability to get involved in, but you know, but it is like I guess, you know, these engineering feats, these sort of architectural creations are, um, and that that ability to help provide for ourselves, our communities should be thanked, and I guess that that's part and part of this a little bit that that little, you know, maybe taking away some of the more specific religious elements. It's just that acknowledgement of thanks and. Uh, gratitude um to you know to, to you know the people that would have built this uh it would have it would have been the next few you know the, 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 they wouldn't necessarily have benefited from it it would have been their ancestors you know um hmm. yeah definitely it's interesting uh, thing to ponder So, um, just for the viewers at home, I'll just go through some of the images I um, I saved for to show the step wells and step ponds of India. So, this one you're looking at now is the Agra Sen Kai Boli step well in New Delhi. Um, that's one of the most famous step wells in, in India. Um, this one is um, 
probably the most famous step pond in India. It's the Chandbori uh, step pond. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, reminiscent of an, an MC Escher, es Escher uh, or Escher um, print. Mm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think it's um, I think it's got thirteen levels this to it as well. Gosh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is a, an aerial view of the Chandbori uh, step pond. Um, so that that's the the Chandbori. Uh, from uh, this is a, a planning section of the building. Um, from uh, greatbuildings.com, I think I got this from. Mm -hmm. And this is um, um, a cut, an axonometric, uh, a cut through axonometric of the a typical, like a step well you found it, you'd find in Gujarat. Go. On. Um, this is a uh, an image I got from the the book. Um, what was the book? The book Handmade Houses and Other Buildings: The World of Vernacular Architecture. Um, it says it says that step wells are triumphs of architecture and engineering, and come in a wide variety of styles and sizes, from the monumental to the modest. In this view, you can see the entrance gate and the beginning of the long flight of steps of a step well with colonnades on either side, which goes down five levels into the earth. And then you've got a plan and uh, cross section from the same book, but it says uh, this plan and cross section of a step well show how the stepped corridor is punctuated by numerous intermediate tower-like pavilions. One way of visualizing it is as a giant triangular wedge with a horizontal line running at ground level, a vertical plunging into the earth and a long diagonal mark in the line of the steps. Yeah, that 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 view, that that drawing makes it look a lot more industrial and you know, it takes away some of the um the poetry and the the you know, the craft that goes into it. Um but I guess you it just reveals what it's doing um on a practical front yeah so the um the next building we're going to look at um is the poglong garai uh temple in vietnam so So I'll just go through my notes on the building. So the Poklong Garai Temple is located in a city in South Vietnam called Phan Rang. The Poklong Garai Temple was built in honor of the Champa King Poklong Garai. It was built during the late 13th and 14th century. The temple complex consists of three architectural structures. The three architectural structures are the main tower, the gate tower, and the fire tower. The main tower is where people go to worship Poklong Garai. The fire tower is the place which is used for keeping valuables, which are used for rituals. And the gate tower is the structure which people traditionally pass through in order to enter the temple complex. So on the earth, uh, on the far right, you can see um, the uh, gate tower, which is where people, you know, tr traditionally pass through in order to get into the temple complex. Um, in the middle, you can see the uh, fire tower, and uh, on the far left, you can see uh, the main tower. Uh, and the main tower, I think, is twenty meters uh, tall. And um, the fire tower is about uh, ten meters tall and the the entrance tower is roughly nine meters tall mm. um red clay bricks were used to construct the three towers and a unique binding agent was used to glue the bricks together the binding agent 
the binding agent was created from uh, and it, it was created from extracts from a species of plant titled Dipterocarpus alatus. Dipterocarpus alatus is a tree which can be found in tropical rainforests of uh, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos. To this day, it is unknown which materials were mixed uh, with the Dipterocarpus alatus in order to create the binding agent for the red bricks. Stone and ceramics are used to uh, engrave figures of uh, dragons, humans, and leaves onto the towers. To this day, uh, Cham people still come to the temple in order to keep alive the tradition of ancient rituals and festivals. For example, the Cham people honor King Po Glongarai by coming to the temple on the 30th of December, on the first day of the seventh uh, lunar month, in order to uh, carry out a ceremony devoted to him. Also, for three days during October, the Kate Festival is held. The Kate Festival is the biggest festival of the year for the Champa people. During the festival, the ancestors and heroes of the Champa people are honoured for three days. Ritual sacrifices to the gods and animated sacred dancing take place within the temple complex. After the religion's rituals have taken place, a party is held in order to celebrate the culture and heroes of the Champa people. So that, that's uh, that's all my notes I've got on that building. So anything you'd like to say, add? Um, do, do, you you have, um, do you have a closer picture? Um, I'm, I'm just I, I'm particularly interested in in brickwork, um, and um, I, I I just. Uh, is that uh, it's just um uh the the thing that I, I i kind of enjoy with brickwork is uh seeing like the bond pattern and how how they've been laid and um i mean it it, it would seem yeah I, i'd be interested to know like how much bigger or smaller they are to our kind of our now modern sort of standard brick and um how that brick has has been used to to create the um because it, it's quite it's mono it's quite monolithic it's 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 sing there's no it, it's hard to tell how the material transitions if if it if it sort of feels like it is the, it is it all break isn't it continued up yeah. into into what is sort of nominally the roof structure yeah oh yeah so um uh again it's it's interesting that you know, the it's you're where the origin of a brick came from it's i mean it's just such an inherently useful clever thing to do um but uh um yeah it, I'm it's interesting curious. how you find it in in almost all cultures you know oh, oh yeah um it, there's a well, there's an inherent logic to it um but it i i think it's it's just particularly interesting to see how how um how they've been able to use the brick to to keep you know to to produce all the embellishment and the ornamentation that how the how, well it's sort of it's hard to even say that it is ornamentation because it's so embedded in the form so fundamental to the form of of the um structure um the only thing that sort of sticks out is the little um uh the corner eaves detail of this little um sort of uh sort of feather or leaf um that, but again it looks like it's still um uh, made from the same clay as the bricks um uh and, and you know uh, uh, yeah from i mean from my my knowledge of brick brick uh, work um you can get special bricks which, so you have your standard bricks but you could also have special bricks that are angled or have a, a molding in them but then there's also you can you know set bricks in and then and then treat the brick like a, a piece of stone to carve into um so i, I yes yeah, so i kind of wonder if if there's an element of that and so the, the the actual craftsman up there would have had a chance to put themselves into 
um, quite what they're doing there. I, I yeah, I'd be curious to know like how much of that as well was designed. You know, it's yeah, because uh, uh, it is quite there's some quite complicated geometry, you know, sort of forms there, and and how to prepare that brickwork as you go. Um, but then, it, it, would that have just been a, an experienced bricklayer who knew how to to create these forms, and there was a maybe a degree of flair, and uh, but then they would, um, you know, guide guide it through a series of of um, intentions. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm also seeing uh, you, you can see that I think, I think a, it was um, like. Um, it was built in their, you know, their style of architecture, which was uh, the, the fat man style, which was local um, to the districts, um, you know, in which it was built in. But then I think um, they also had the influence of uh, Greater India as well, you know, which their 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 style of architecture grew out of. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I just uh, just finally note as well. You you've got a, a potential order there as well. You know, you've got a column and a capital. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I I always like to pick up on that sort of. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll just go from my other uh, photos. I've got um, showing the, the firehouse. Um, yeah, sort of. Uh, there, there is a, I, you know, just a lot of classical nods there of, of a uh, sort of pal pilasters, um, you know, in, yeah. uh, you know, squared columns that are, are, are bonded with the surface, actually part of the surface of the main building, and um, get a sense of depth there, isn't it? Of uh, it's make it it's a bit of, make a bit of an illusion that um yeah it's interesting uh, that because i i i could be wrong but i can't imagine them having much contact with um say ancient greece and ancient rome but that, yeah, that's what i'm curious about like yeah I, I, w could, could a trade a trader have you know gone out that way and and caught glimpse of you know some you know, uh, Greek temple, and and then come back, and because you know, it's a, I guess a, but you know, it, it's kind of both, somewhat that is so long ago. It's kind of some sort of going both ways a little bit. But oh well, yeah, we, Egypt um, would have had a you know had a, a I guess the the earliest sort of column, I think. If I'm right in saying, I may be wrong there. Uh, the very, very early. No, I think you're right there. In, yeah. In terms yeah, of, sort of I think the ancient Greeks developed their architecture from from Egypt. Um, oh, that's that, what you know. People yeah. believed. I think um, was the case. But, but there, at least there's again, it, it's it's just it's the fundamentals of you have a column that holds something up. You know that. The, and it's going to be straight it's you know th there's reasons why you get a flared you know it, it there's a in a classical column it it has a emphasis where it's wider at the bottom than at the top um, um you know you want a bit more mass at the bottom and it also it gets a sense you get yeah you know, well that classical side topic there but but there's a logic to it that's inherent that's universal um you know the the expression of the structural load, um, and so it's not it's not surprising that there are these universal um, forms. Yeah, you've got stretcher stretcher bond brickwork down here. Um, um, you all right? Yeah, it just there's there's fundamental uh, um, universal uh, principles to a structure standing standing up, and uh, it, um, it's only until the uh, enlightened twentieth century that Dewey decided to rethink that. Um,
Yeah, some interesting um, like ornamentation. Yeah, it's the, almost uh, like um, I'm, I I I feel like I'm maybe just comparing this to other things, but it just um, reminds me of the 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 um, like the the, the finials on top of like a. Uh, on cathedrals or gothic um on the buttresses where you get that um finial detail that goes up um yeah. uh, but, it, but it's completely great. different scale yeah you were saying almost looks like little gargoyles almost you know like little well yeah 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 you'd see on a gothic cathedral yeah yeah it's, it's yeah it's interesting how every like culture around the world has their own you know but, ornamentation or you know all they have their yeah, own uh, columns or you know they have their own ornamentation which but, has been but, carved into their buildings or yeah but it, even though like i i am sort of pointing out maybe similarities it's still very much its own thing and it yeah. i think that's maybe another sort of mistake that, that to think that you know, you can't have a vertical column uh, or, you know, because, you know, it's not different enough or something. It's, um, you know, you can see the amount of imagination and variation that goes on, um, uh, you know, in the examples that we've been seeing, um, that it, you, you don't have to sort of fundamentally reinvent it. There's, you know, a, a, there's an awful lot of expression there still, uh, available um yeah imagination all particular, start there. They're all particular to their culture and yeah yeah you know, um, yeah so, part of the world they found themselves in yeah so i guess that's it's a, a thought on, on the the it's like the, the palette of materials the, as in h how big your palette is or how broad it is it's it's um i guess you're rather than worrying about like uh you know, you know what your structure you know, are, are you uh you um copying a, you know, or is it too similar to something else you're the, you know the focus is is um the execution and the detail um and the, because you i almost could see a little bit of the japanese temple in this uh, just uh, just a little bit uh, um but it's execution and its detailing is so different that it's it, you know it, um it's its own thing um you know, quite obviously but um so i'll see what other images i've got of this um this uh, building so this is the kalan Yes, yeah, so, uh, yes. Yeah, interesting seeing the then the the statues coming in at the the nook and uh, uh, yeah, and again there's some nice mouldings there and uh, again all all in brick or at least in in clay you've cast yeah um, i think that like uh, seven it's um yeah i think it goes back to like uh the, the late 1200s as well it said 13th mm. 14th century it was made mm. it was constructed so yeah yeah i i guess uh i can't remember if you mentioned it in your introduction to it like the the, the clay for the bricks is that is that presumably fairly local and it's no. a, a fairly firm clay it's not it, it's sort of a firm brick that's produced it's not too um it's sort of it stood the test of time fairly well it's not worn too much there's still some quite nice crisp edges there but i yeah no i, I didn't mention anything about the brick it was the binding agent um, yeah 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 um yeah that's fascinating there's not there's no uh concrete or uh lime uh oh yeah yeah it says that um it said that it didn't know what uh what other materials were used uh with you know oh with the, the, the binding yeah. with the dipterocarpus alitus extracts 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. The, they got this extract from a tree that they found that they found in like tropical rainforests in Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam. Hmm. And Laos. Um but they don't know what other materials they they mixed it with, you know, in order to create the extracts, which is you know quite fascinating. That's, yeah, yeah. So this is a photo of the Kit Festival. They still have the, the Cham people still have. Yeah, it's quite interesting how they still seem to be quite connected to their roots. Um, yeah, I guess I. Yeah, I wonder how you know how uh different it is compared to you know a, still like a you know a christmas you know carol service going on in a cathedral um oh I like is it is it i guess they haven't been sort of got you know homogenized in the global you know world quite as much but um is it is it still more integral or would the locals sort of see it as maybe some people see like an, an easter service or something as for some people to do or um yeah it, uh, yeah i guess i hope i hope it is still a, a nicely you know a well embodied tradition is still alive p properly alive yeah uh, hopefully it's not like a mcdonald's uh well yeah yeah, 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 yeah i guess you yeah, fear like yeah, maybe an, an image of, uh, like this is sort of uh, Hopefully it's not like just for a tourist uh, brochure or something. So um, the next uh, building we've got to discuss is the um, the Bali uh, Kuren. So I'll just gather my notes on that. So just. Uh, some of my notes on this building are the following. The typical traditional Bali, the typical, uh, the typical traditional Bali house is composed of separate buildings residing within a walled compound on a square plot of land. Usually a large family or a group of related families live in a traditional Bali house. These vernacular houses are designed to be adapted to Bali's unique hot and wet monsoon seasons. The buildings are usually constructed with timber using a post and beam construction system. The buildings are open to the elements and often use different roof shapes. A master carpenter often constructs these homes with the aid of local villages. Stone or built brick is used for the foundations. Hardwood is used for the columns of the building. The columns rest on a stone base and the stone base rests on a masonry platform. Hardwoods are used as they are less affected by dry rot and termites. The floors of the building are lifted off the ground of the, as this allows cool breezes to enter the house from below and keeps food and belongings away from dampness. Bamboo or lighter woods are used in the upper part of the house as non-load bearing walls, as non-load bearing walls fitted together using mortise and tenon joints secured with wooden pegs or tied. The, the the roofs of the individual buildings usually have large overhanging eaves as this protects the occupants from harsh direct sunlight and tropical rainstorms. The roofs are usually clad in thatch made of rice straw, dried grass, sugar, palm or coconut leaves. The people of Bali traditionally endeavour for a natural balance and harmony in their lives and this is reflected in their architecture as the Bali Kuren has a balance of male and female, negative and positive, as well as the sacred and the profane. So that's just some of the notes I've got on that um, that traditional Bali house. Is there anything you uh, any thoughts you've got on that? Uh, um, uh, no, yeah, not not at the moment. Uh, I think. Do you want to uh, go to the next? Yeah, sure. I'll just um, show a couple of um, images I've got online of the mm. Bali house. 
just showing um, traditional Balinese houses are built almost entirely of organic materials, wood, bamboo, grass faction, plant fibers. So quite a nice I mean, little constructional yeah. drawing there. Yeah, and, and, and quite a good, just, you know, good, good diagram to learn about pretty universal and once again structural um, form that, that is in most houses even today. Um, you could recognize that. I'm just showing the uh, some of the individual buildings. So you've got your sleeping pavilion there, um, and you've got your guest pavilion there, uh, your kitchen there, and then you've got your, your granary. Yeah, so I mean, it's in interesting. I guess the yeah the the climate here is you know, very much driving it, and how um, it's not one structure, it's not one home. It's it's a series of it's a series of rooms, uh, which you know the buildings and the rooms. So the form of the you know the compound forms the house, um, yeah, uh, which is. Uh, is there any uh, that's that's uh, it's quite a um, I guess that's that's um, I guess shows the importance of air circulation and and maybe separate getting good separation between different activities um, that they're responding to um, yeah it goes back as well I think to what I said at the beginning about um, how, like how the the spatial layout and construction of a vernacular building often reveals abstract uh, concepts about an ethnic group's religious beliefs and values yeah, yeah. which in turn is often underpinned by its own mythos as well as more practical ideas or practical Absolutely. concerns such as climate so moving on to the next building we've got the mongolian gear so i'll just go through some of my notes on that so the Mongolian gear is used by peoples of the High Mongolian steppes. Thirty percent of country are semi-nomadic herders. Mongolia is a landlocked country between Russia and China, most sparsely populated country in the world. Easy to uh, erect, dismantle, and transport on their camels, yaks, and horses. Gear is the way Roman Mongolian. Poles, posts, and coverings are used for its construction. Mongolian gear acts like a kit of parts as it can e easily be erected, dismantled, and transported. It takes only an hour to dismantle a gear and a family's possessions in order for it to be taken with them on their horses, camels, and yaks. Gears are adapted to suit the Mongolian climate, which is composed of long, cold winters where temperatures can reach minus 30 degrees and short hot and rainy summers in the winter gears are kept warm by stores and kept extra layers of felt in the winter gears are kept warm by stores stoves and extra layers of felt whereas in the summer the gear can be ventilated by turning the covers up the mongolians see the gear as a sacred space which has symbolic significance, and this is reflected in the gear's orientation and spatial layout. Lattice panels made from flexible willow are expounded and tied together to form the circular structural framework. The roof structure is made up of steam bent poles, and the entire gear is clad in coverings made from felted wool, which are kept in place by ropes made from the hairs of camels and horses. Thor always faces south. It's believed that the threshold is, is where the spirit of the home lives. Mongolian gate uh, roof is uh, crowned by a compression ring known as the shang rack. The shang rack enables smoke from the stove to escape. The shang rack is also usually passed down from the family line, even if a gate ends up being fixed or a new one constructed. In terms of spatial layout, the gear is traditionally split into five different areas, which consist of four quadrants and one circular space in the centre of the gear. 
so i'll just uh go through some of the images i've got so this is the image i've got from the book uh I mentioned earlier is it yeah. uh, vernacular handmade houses and other buildings a world of vernacular architecture so this shows um like the structure of the uh the gear you know it shows like the lattice panels shows like the door as well door frame yeah i i thought it was interesting um again there's that um spiritual transcendent aspect to it you know it's it's not just uh you know shelter or a, uh even you know it's it's something more than that it's um uh, that you know, e even in this world, you know, very utilitarian from the outside, you know, very plain and simple structure that's doing in very direct. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not wasteful in any way. Um, they still find a moment to have a little bit of spiritual transcendence there, um, and I, I think that you, I'm sure coming up, you'll have a look at the inside, which. Um, are fantastic you you come you know real surprise the um the uh the, the decoration of the the um the internal um structure um it's it's great you kind of feel like a long cold winters they've got something to do yeah it, i guess um it shows that like the the you know, abstract concepts, you know, the spatial layout shows, um, reflects abstract say, concepts about their way of life, um, as well, you know. Yeah. So this is, um, an image from the same book as well, showing, you know, the construction of, uh, you know, it shows the steam bent poles support the roof and how, you know, how the mats are made from felted wool and how they're tied together from ropes from the horse or camel hair shows you the solid wood frame for the door and the lattice work for the frame of the gear as well and then uh, this image here from the same book shows you the layout of the room as well oh yeah with an altar hmm that's very interesting I just got some images of uh, of like in real life Mongolians uh, creating a gear. So you see the the wooden lattice uh, panels there. See the door frame put into place, and they're starting to place the roof poles as well. So yeah, you yeah, just yeah Mongolian gear the roof with roof poles in place. So then in this one's you've got the fin cover, fin inner cover on the roof. And then this one's uh, the felt is being felt covers being added. Adding the outer cover on this one. And then I guess it's on the Mongolian steps. So the next building we've got is the uh, Fujian Tulu. So, oh, yeah. Try and find my notes for it. So the Fujian uh, Tulu can be found in Fujian, which is a province in southwest China. The Tulu is usually in a mountainous areas of western Fujian. The Tulu is a large defensive structure built between the 13th and 20th century. It was built to house one family clan, built by the Hakka people to protect themselves from armed bandits. It could take seven years to build one of these structures. 
The structure of these enclosed buildings consisted of stone for the foundations and the base of the walls, later plastered with clay. The foundations and the base support six foot thick air walls, which are reinforced with bamboo canes. The interior construction of the building consists of a mainly timber structure of beams, decks and columns, which contains 250 rooms to house 80 odd families in. All the rooms face onto the central courtyard in which an ancestral shrine is kept. The mud wall facade is largely uh, largely blank with small windows only appearing on the upper floor. Mid entrance is an armor plated wooden door designed to keep bandits out. The bottom floors have communal kitchens, grain stores and rooms used for washing eat and eating, while the upper floors have living and sleeping quarters with verandas. A small family owns a vertical set of these rooms. A large family may own two or three. And then uh, fortified buildings uh, were banned in China in the 1960s, unfortunately. So just a picture of a Tulu here. And then this is um, a cross-section of uh, one of the famous uh, Tulus in China. Yeah, you've you've got the uh, the rammed earth exterior wall there. That's a that's a quite a common uh, uh, in, you know, environmentalist or, or modern architectural um, uh, go to. Um, yeah, yeah there's a great rammed earth building I saw in Australia. Uh, it's, it's, uh, online, it's a yeah, really good one. I forgot what it's called. I think it's um, the Great Wall of uh, Western Australia, I think it is by Roselli Architects. Mm. So, next image on this is the uh, King of the Toulouse. This is a uh, image of one, uh, one of the most famous Chinese Toulouse. Uh, it's called Cheng Huilu. So and this is uh, an internal view, an internal drawing of Cheng Huilu. So it shows the four concentric ring structure of this extraordinary building. Going outward from the center, we see the ancestral hall surrounded by a circular covered corridor. The second ring is one story high, has 32 rooms and served as a community library. The third ring is two stories high, with 40 rooms on each level. The outer ring is four stories high, 72 rooms on each level, a total of 400 rooms. And then this is just a oh, real yeah. life photo from Chink Quillo. So it's interesting how the, the ancestral stretch, the ancestral shrine is the focal point of this uh, building you know it, it uh, dominates the central courtyard yeah um yeah i i can't i mean maybe this isn't a particularly worthwhile comment but i just i can't help but think of um the pinocti pinoctical <laughs> you know? yeah it, um I, it's yeah, like from pinoctical. it has uh, got that feel to it yeah uh but um yeah i guess they're all looking out onto the shrine or the ancestral yeah the ancestral temple thing um it also reminds me of um uh the globe theater uh um, i i mean it's fairly it's a round form but but there is it does have a it feels a bit like a stage isn't it Inher inherently with the the balconies everything looking in you you kind of you're on the spot. Uh, it feels like I feel like there's a performance should sort of take place, or, or something to watch, or something. Maybe but that that's maybe this ancestral um, shrine. But then also it's uh, you know defensive, isn't it? Defensive and everything. Yeah, meant to, meant to have been built to keep out armed bandits. Um, yeah. So 
So moving on to the uh, the final building is uh, Angkor Wat, which um, I mean to be fair, like with Angkor Wat and the EC Grand Shrine, I, I feel like you could do like a stream on just those you know buildings. Yeah. So you know, you could do like an hour or two stream just on Angkor Wat. So Angkor Wat is um, it's in Cambodia. Uh, it's the largest temple complex in the world. Originally built by King Su Suryaman II in the capital of the Khmer Empire, Yadshodharapura, in the 12th century, as the empire's official state temple. It was originally a Hindu temple, but got converted to a Buddhist temple at the end of the 12th century. It was originally dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. Angkor Wat combines a temple mountain with a gallery temple. The temple mountain is signified by the twin corrects of four towers surrounding a central spire. Angkor Wat was designed to represent Mount Meru, which in Hindu and Buddhist cosmology is the home of the Devas. It's an important pilgrimage site for Buddhists and in one of the best it one of the best examples of temple architecture in the world. It's revered for the quality of its architecture, bas reliefs and statues of Buddhas and Devas. The entire outer galleries are, com are covered floor to ceiling in bas relief carvings, which intertwine the local people's religion, history and myth. At 2,600 feet, the temple contains the longest continuous bas reliefs in the world. And then I'd just I'd go on uh, to say as well that uh, I think it's a big, um, that I think the Cambodians hold this building dear to their heart. And um, I think the I think the Cambodians have had Angkor Wat on their national flag for going back to at least 1948, maybe even further, actually. Hmm. So have you you've got any um, thoughts on this building there? Well, uh, do, you have, do you have some more photos so we zoom in? Um, I, I'm, um, I, I, I'm kind of interested. I feel like there's, there's um, sorry, my brain's getting a bit tired now. Uh, there's uh, a lot of yeah, man, so. a lot of um, uh, similarities to the earlier one uh, with the brick building. Um, I forgot what it's called now. Um, it, it just that that the repetition of the the form and the, and also it's this quite um pointed uh uh tower um uh it um it's quite it, that form is sort of quite unusual in in uh western architectural tr tr you know tradition uh, tradition it uh, at least it feels you, even though i don't think it is it sort of feels slightly domed um like with that proportion we'd see more um sort of orthog orthogonally um uh um is it stone it does look like um uh, i mean it, it there seems to be an awful lot of um weathering on it uh, it's to the point where it's even hard the the wider view i thought it's kind of it's sort of blending sort of into the landscape quite seamlessly um i wonder uh, in its heyday it would have been a bit more um contrasting a bit more prominent um i guess that's the uh, curious about that the stone that is made out of and and um how it's weathered or, or, um and that the the tiering form again. I, I guess I might might say that it does feel feels like this um, is very it is very orderly um, in a way that um, maybe more so than, some, than most of the other examples we've been looking at. Um, uh, it, it it does it feels uh, that it must have been largely designed. Um, but uh, 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 it's a, an interesting one with the the switching of uh, religions and how that's affected it, or um, uh, you know, uh, has that 
has it remained relatively unchanged or has has um parts of it um been reformed through that transition um and it looks like in the middle there it looks like almost tarpaulin if they're like working on it um that's why one thing uh i uh i was uh i, I enjoyed the art critic uh brian sewell if uh, you've heard of him he was evening standard and he was did the bbc occasionally when it was it would commission someone like him to do a, an art documentary and he complained about old buildings being cleaned up too much uh, and losing that um all the carbon deposits and all that that uh, the layers of of uh, time um and uh yeah he was sort of advocating um leaving or, or scruffing up old buildings, leaving a little bit of a trace of that. Um, uh, but yeah, I feel like this building is is something else compared to what it probably would have been. Um, do you have any more photos? Yeah, yeah. I imagine it being uh, even more glorious. Um, uh, yeah, because. Yeah. Adds a yeah. certain character to the building as well, doesn't it? Like the, uh, the weathering. Yeah, because I guess if it, if that was like um uh like a brighter, even just a slightly brighter stone, it would have reflected the light and uh st stood it out amongst the uh, the trees around it. Um, you know, being quite. Whereas now it it, it sort of really s sort of sinks in, and the the forms of the towers are are have that quite soft kind of almost you know the because they have this sort of um uh almost like a canopy of a tree they have that uh branch break the sort of a uh, stratification almost of uh, each they have a layer to them uh so the whole thing now feels very part of the nature um even though it, it, it the more you look at it the more it does to me seem like quite a you know, it, it, you just have to see that, you know, it, it's actually maybe got more, it's sort of the uh, ancestor of like uh, Versailles, almost. So it, you know, when you look at it like that, uh, it's this great uh, moat and, uh, you know, the avenue of, or a track heading out, um, you know, this is, this is an orchestrated, um, you know, um, uh, intervention. This is a big and well considered. Um, very different to the uh, the huts that we were just earlier looking at. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah, this image really shows um, just like the vastness of the complex as well. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a huge site because you know the buildings massive as it is and then you you've got that huge square and it you know and it's it i mean yes it's a um it's an interesting one with the whole like uh it is a right angle unnatural uh you know uh, so you know it, the the more natural form is to be a uh, curve but then you know uh, if, if we design curvy buildings they tend to actually look rather unnatural but then the buildings that sort of tend to sit most peacefully in in a landscape tend to actually be the kind of simple brick or stone or timber to, or, or you know orthogonal buildings um uh, uh but it, but then you know when you see a, a context like this with a you know a, a water with a with a right angle it's distinctly unnatural oh and it, it does yeah. um yeah you, you yeah, definitely got that man-made feel to it. Yeah. Like you, 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 you don't really, you don't get like a straight river, do you? <laughs> yeah, especially not right angle corners. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just, oh, yeah. uh, a plan view of the uh, temple yeah, complex. Yeah. Uh, another more detailed plan view. That's great. And then this one's just a photo of the gallery. Yeah. See some of the bas reliefs. Uh, yeah, you, you, uh, 
I mean, you've got some some yeah, good mouldings and uh, uh, um, embellishments there. That, um, that that's very sophisticated work. That sort of um, yeah, it, it'd be interesting to know like, sort of where where you know, where the, the craftsmen are trained and come from, and because that that's yeah yeah there's um that's uh, that i'd say is mentioning you know very, becoming very polite architecture yeah. <laughs> isn't it it's becoming very conscious yeah just some uh another uh, bad relief there mm. some wonderful detail there yeah, the more the more you look at it, the more layer upon layer, isn't it? Yeah, and just another one there as well. Yeah, I, I, this I guess shows as well the uh, the, the storytelling you know, the, of of uh, you know the, it's an opportunity to to tell stories of you know uh, obviously. Well, presumably in this instance, gods and stuff. But you know, it, it could be an you know, just it's an opportunity to tell tell stories about who have gone before, um, which is another thing that I think um, we don't really know how to do anymore. Like how to how to, how to um, tell stories about uh, not you know real stories, you know, real tales or of, um, uh, our you know our families and our ancestors. It's it's and it it's that 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 would have been a, a huge tradition prior to the you know to to, to television and uh, yeah that that that's you know the entertainment and the, the, I, that oral that oral storytelling tradition as well that yeah exactly and uh, everyone would have had that sort of maybe a maybe would have had a at least a. Or at least some you know, more than there are now. You know, had um, a, a theatrical quality, a, you know, a great delivery of of telling a, a thrilling story. Um, but then also you've got these, you know, the, the carve carvers and masons able to you know capture them and, and cap you know, in a different medium and to help prolong them and help elaborate them. So it, it, the conversation again, you know, you might have someone who's telling the stories orally but then you can have someone capturing them visually or uh, yeah. it, um yeah you just yeah. mentioned in the oral, oral storytelling it just uh remind me of uh i think the other week i saw richard Burton telling a story on some interview it, it's just a normal story but just the way he told it you know um yeah it's really interesting like obviously he had a great voice a great thespian uh, <laughs> but uh yeah the, the way like the ums and the ahs and the the uh i guess i, I yeah when I to know, use I, a loud voice or, and when to use a low voice and when to speak quietly and so on and so forth uh, uh, absolutely absolutely i think i think it's um yeah you know, just to be able to tell you know, a little tale you know something that may have just happened to you an amusing little uh, tell you, you know, anecdote, uh, um, but to be able to deliver that in a witty, suspenseful, engaging, entertaining um, way—it's um, it's a it's a wonderful art. And um, you know, the kind of the minor way that I've sort of you know, when you kind of have got a good story and you can capture someone's attention, or if you especially like a few people's attention, yeah. Um, and it's great to be able to kind of. Uh, play them a little bit you know you know you you, you it, that's that's the real art to sort of as you say like you know you maybe deliver a bit of you know part of the tale sort of quieter and then you crescendo or something and you can you know uh, uh play with their delights and hopefully you know conclude with sort of laughter or joy of some kind um uh yeah uh, well uh, yeah <laughs> a whole other Topic, talking I guess, about there. visual visual storytelling as well. Um, I love the old Catholic, like old Catholic churches. Uh, the Stations of the Cross and stuff. Is that what you're thinking of? Um, just just the old Catholic churches I've been to. Uh, 
in my life it, it, like generally like the old ones are very uh you know you've got all stories from the bible and and so on and so forth whereas the modern ones they, they lose all that ornate storytelling um brilliance yeah. but yeah I'll, I'll, and st- um uh, episodes of the cross as well yeah i i yeah i guess a, a little bit of yeah i'm sure there's a fair bit of you know illiteracy would have prepared you know uh, perpetuated sort of visual s- storytelling in in that regard uh, as well um uh but it i guess it helps to get to a deeper level like to actually see like uh you know ghoulish creatures or uh you know uh, uh you know angels transcending you know, ascending to heaven and uh, yeah. you know um there's uh, um well, so I'm lucky, I'm lucky yeah. enough to have seen the Sistine Chapel, and that was a that was a breathtaking. Yeah, I I I I did go uh, as a child, but we we couldn't we we didn't get in. I don't think um, so. I can't remember quite what happened, but um, I'd love to uh, I'd love to see it um, if, if that's <laughs> ever possible. Um, yeah, hopefully, uh, when lockdown ends, hopefully, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it's also like it's very fragile as well. Like the Sistine Chapel, I think they've, they have to restrict the number of people that go in, um, even if it was open or we could travel. Yeah, do you have oh, some yeah. more images? Uh, no, that's it. That's it for that. But yeah, it, as as you as you say, it's sort of um, it's like, like every culture has this. Uh, you know, with their buildings, they have these ornate um, stories that they tell, you know, which help to provide sustenance to their people and show how how great their people are, you know, or, you know, trying to um, uplift their people or through, through, their, through their ornate carvings on the buildings. And the broader point, the broader architectural point is actually... Um, a lot of people uh, engage with architecture through ornament such as this, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and to throw yeah. that out the window is a great travesty. Um, yeah, well, it, well uh, I, you know, I think the, a, a big kind of key point you'd be making, uh, although I think we'd both be making, is the, you know, the, the vernacular architecture comes out of, a, you know, it's a conversation with the previous generation and it's you know it's them handing you down their their import you know the imported wisdom of those that have gone before them and you know and then uh, you know the, this this ornamentation and this detail again it's 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 that conversation it's that you know yeah. it, you know it's a uh, um it's respect it's the younger generations respecting and valuing the wisdom and it's the older generation you know, um, uh, realizing the importance of what they've got and what maybe they've contributed to it in a little way. It could be a very minor way. That's fine. And you hand it on. Whereas now I think, yeah, we've, we've just, well, as we see, we, 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 we just think we're better or we, we just think it's an irrelevance or it's uh, a a, a curiosity or something, um, a passing curiosity. Um, but you know, we, you know, we're, (laughs) The, hub- the hubris of the the modern man um, yeah. and i think it, it's the height of in terms of architecture it's the height not just in architecture but it's the height of arrogance well yeah, you know, yeah. the height of uh arrogance is you know to throw away because ornaments been with us ever since there's been civilization there's people have put ornament yeah. on buildings and absolutely for like someone like Adolf Luz to come along and write ornament is crime, and to I think that you're just going to throw throw out like six thousand years of human well, wisdom and knowledge. Well, that that's no ornament, and also, yeah, he. he um, well, that, that yeah. well, I mean, that's it. I, I, it's a, a point I've often made is, um, uh, you know, where, so I, you know, I've, I'm a qualified architect and spent years you know doing studying it and you know with with a with a, a modest exception of years uh, uh, sorry a modest exception of lectures or something pretty much all we're taught is the last hundred years 
um, yeah. you know, you you might get the old little you know one term of you know a little uh, whirlwind tour, um, but it'll be an overview or something. Um, but you know, you, you'd, it'd be very difficult to sort of draw upon like a, a um, an architect from two hundred years ago. Um, they they would always push you towards n- the now. Um, you know, my argument simply is like I I'd like to draw upon the you know the two thousand plus years of architectural yeah. tradition rather than a hundred years of architectural tradition at a yeah. push. That is because that's the other thing is, is it, you know the, the actual you know the the claim of you know diversity and all this is you know if uh, I was try I tried to challenge a, an architecture friend of mine like actually like you pretty much can you you're pretty much dealing with maybe only like 20 to 30 architects um when it comes to to, to when you're studying architecture you know uh, because there's a lot of architects that are like the the pupil of or the you know the lesser version and you'd you'd kind of go via one to the other um and and it's it, it's just this little body of people the probably you know half of which knew each other and that's meant to be our resource you know that's meant to make our precedents that we uh, use to design our buildings and everything whereas i i'm interested in you know i i've got loads of books and stuff where i'm i'm looking back at buildings that don't have architects because they don't know who they were but then also uh, countless other well-known, lesser-known um, architects and, and or craftsmen, you know, all sorts. Um, I I just think that's it's such a richer, uh, uh, more um, uh, enjoyable and life-affirming and uh, you know uh, bountiful kind of body of work to explore, rather than a fairly repetitive, uh, you know. 20th century architecture um repetitive and fairly soul destroy you know um uh, definitely i think um uh, zumpha has got a great quote on this and it but it sort of echoes t.s Eliot. t.s Eliot has got that great essay on on tradition i think oh yeah, yeah i have that yeah yeah um towards a is it oh is that the towards a definition I can't remember the name of the essay, but he's got this great passage in it, and he, he talks about um, basically the connection uh, between you know the 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 old and the new, and how you know uh, you know basically if it, if uh, it's if it's if it's just if it's just new, then it's not it's not relevant. If it's not if it's just old, it's not relevant. But if it has to have like a timeless quality to it, you know. And um, Zumfer echoes T.S. Eliot when he says um, something like, um, I forgot what he said, but yeah, just how, yeah, ju- uh, yeah, just basically the melding of, um, I forgot what they exactly said, but yeah, just that connection between the past and the present between the past and the present you know it's uh... exactly it's a it's a living thing it's 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 a as i say it's like a conversation it's not it's not um this is where people i think people get it wrong like um they think that you know uh you know you get these the, the big criticism of of uh, any anyone who practicing traditional architecture is their pastiche that they're just copying you know uh whereas um you know what 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 we're doing is actually we're we're firstly acknowledging that that we're being humble that that that, you know the thousands of years of of uh combined intellect have have left some pretty solid lessons that we can learn from but then also um you know uh it, it we are we are still a character in this and we are still you know bringing our 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 particular moment in time our particular you know um uh, take on things and and as you have a conversation you uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of parallels with language and architecture and you know you you articulate things differently and or you emphasize things differently like you know, kind of like we're talking earlier about the storytelling and stuff and um you know the even if there is uh, you know very you know, similarities and stuff there is yeah. a, a expression and in it and 
character that comes out of that. But I'd say that it, what's more important is is an element of continuity, you know, of, of you know familiarity and and a shared you know cult, cultural legacy there. That that is is how you, that you you is it's it's when you go to a you know uh, if you go to a, a, a you know beautiful village in England, uh, you know all the gardens you know. Yeah, pretty pretty much i'd say nine out of ten you know the gardens will be nicely kept they'll be or at least they'll be very interesting there'll be lots of nice flowers and you know wisterias climbing on the walls and stuff and and the the properties would be you know well looked after and you know yes there's a lot of money around but it's also because they all everyone in that village are pulling together they all love that place they all it's they're all they all have a mutual interest in perpetuating it yeah. Um, where whereas the the way that we're actually heading, and I see this from where I live, you know, that it, you know everyone's so transient, and uh, you know people obviously talk different languages, they have different yeah. routines, different cultures, different everything, and there's there's no direction, there's no. Um, and like what um, you were saying with the villages, it's that David Goodhart's got that book, and that great phrase, the the, the somewheres. Yeah, yeah, I've read that. It's, um, yeah, I mean that. that so many uh, fantastic kind of uh, little statistics and quotes in that. Um, uh, it, 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 yeah, it's just it's so true. But it's it, you know, it's something that we're just turning our back on. But um, but yeah, I I, I kind of yeah try, trying to be optimistic that I I think there is some degree of tide turning. Um, I think um, uh, I, I think what's in, in from you know kind of bring it to real world kind of examples and stuff of um uh so i i used to work for um adam architecture and adam architecture do um uh uh they do a lot of urban urban master plans urban design and uh they i you know so there's they, they've largely been involved in um Poundbury, which everyone likes to uh be divisive over um but they've they've got a new uh, a, a new master plan that's uh i think phase one or two is just finished a uh, 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 new key um and um you know that that very much tunes in with you know it's a uh, cornish uh culture and history and traditions uh, or, or cultural um history um but it also has moments of uh, some some witty moments and um uh th- yeah that the bring out the the um particulars of the area and the place and it there's nothing too bold but it's it's just drawing upon what's there um and pr- presenting it you know making sure it, it's you know meets modern living expectations and standards but also inevitably you know the people designing it are going to come with their own as i say their own um point of view and history and and they will translate and interpret things in a particular way um uh and i, I you know i i'd love to get i have been there but i from what i'm seeing and what i'm hearing it's um it has it's won awards and it, it's it's um you know it's doing it's doing some great you know it's, it's some great work um so I, I think you know there is some uh potential there in the future that we can return to some of these lessons yeah definitely um, and um fingers crossed yeah i I just think um uh yeah i I just i it's it's trying to it's it's a difficult one because like architectural education is pretty um pretty uh indoctrinating and pretty relentless it's uh um and yeah it's hard to capture maybe if you someone you know, the young students going through it uh, to, to sort of try and prevent them from being, you know, uh, consumed by it. But, um, uh, you know, I think hopefully, uh, you know, if you're strong enough to survive it uh, and uh, hold on to uh, some integrity of your your own actual principles, if you, you know, if, um, it's, uh, um, there is, you know, great working opportunities out there. Um, and uh, And I think as maybe more and more, young people realize there's a career to be made in working in the traditional architectural fields um and and all other areas of of the that con- traditional construction world you know stone carving yeah. and 
uh, plaster work and whatnot, um, and the other other traditional techniques and stuff, then I hope hopefully there may be further sort of flourishing of it. Um, uh, just sort hopefully. of hopefully getting we need people, people to aware. Keep, the, um, keep those traditions alive. Keep those crafts. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To spread it, spread that knowledge to. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, to keep. Yeah, I think I, th I think our, maybe our role is just to ensure that you know these things um, aren't forgotten yet, <laughs> at least do our best to prevent them from being forgotten. We don't have to necessarily do much with them in the sense of reinvent them too much. That's that's not that that's not I feel that's the the hang up of our age is being original and new and yeah. Um, uh, we just have to maybe maybe our role is just to uh, keep it alive and hand it on. Yeah, yeah. To try to be good rather than yeah uh, necessarily be original every single time. You know, reinvent the the wheel it, when it, it's necessary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, just uh, one further point on. Um, it, I, I remembered it now when I was talking about Adolf Loser uh, and you know him divorcing himself from 6,000 years of, you know, human wisdom and knowledge by writing an essay called Ornament is Crime. And also um, within that essay, he writes about uh, this, you know, obsession with efficiency and the industrial revolution and the machine and how everything's got to be efficient and uh, how I think that is a poor metaphor for architecture. Um, you know, in, in terms of relating it to yeah. the machine and relating it to, uh, you know, how it's got to be like capitalism or it's got to be, you know, done quick, you know, efficiently and, uh, you know, and as efficient as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, and obviously I'm not saying it has to be, you know, you build it as slow and, and as inefficient as possible, but it's um, great architecture is not, it doesn't come from um yeah it doesn't come from pure utility um yeah, pure, you know, yeah. and, and this is uh, one of the arguments that scruton makes in his um aesthetics of architecture um you know the the, the there is a utility in um in in the beauty in in that fine craft and in uh, you know um that that is there's nothing, you know. That, um, I, I'm <laughs> too too late. My memory is not working. He 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 does. Uh, I think make quite a good argument in that about you know what 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 are you looking at as utility and you know what why is you know, when you eat food is the flavour of it of no utility? You know, um, is the look of the food the meal that you prepared of no utility? You know, if if you took his logic and applied it to food, you know, you you just have like a like a high nu highly nutritious kind of gruel. Um, yeah. You know, th th there is a utility in you know in you know um, making a delicious meal, in dressing smartly, in yeah. uh, you know decorating a room, in you know. Um, it's you know, an end in itself, it, isn't it? Beauty. Yeah, it, you know, um, but you know, I I, like, I I enjoy gardening, and I I I've got a little garden here, and I I I find like when this you know the you know in the summer the it's you know overflowing and you know great colours and textures and whatnot, and uh, it fills me with great joy, you know, and, and, and you know it, it, I love to you know see you know the bees and everything and the the life that comes out of it, and some of it's edible, you know. Uh, uh, and it's great, you know. It's a, uh, you know, and, it, and I, I often kind of come back to the house and I just like to have a moment, just like looking at it and enjoying, like, all oh, that sort of what's changed and what's come up, and um, you know, and it brings joy in it, uh, you know, and that, you know, um, makes life a little bit more like, you know, life. I mean, if if uh, yeah. you know, uh, um, you could say that that's of no utility or maybe it would have been more efficient well, as it like, used it, you know it used to be just a big hedge and uh you know i yeah. took the hedge out and put a whole load of plants there <laughs> um 
But maybe someone, yeah. someone heartless would say that, wouldn't they? Just pure utility. That would be be a soulless yeah. world to live in, wouldn't it? I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, like um, the more we can get back to truth, goodness, and beauty, the three pillars of you know the ancients, uh, Greeks, and probably onto a winner, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, beauty is definitely vanishing within our world, as uh, Scruton so eloquently put in his uh, his brilliant documentary, uh, "Why Beauty Matters," uh, and in his, in his book of the same name, and he's you know he's been he's been the champion champion in beauty his whole career, and uh, yeah, he, not many people put it better than him to be honest on, on why uh, absolutely. Beauty. Yeah, no, I, I mean, if you raise that at an architecture school, it's like beauty is objective. There's no such thing, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, that's so, it's so uh, bottom level, you know, intellectual. It's, it, you know, there's, you know, that's just, it's, there's nothing that, you know, that, well, that's fundamentally, it's just a regurgitation. That person hasn't engaged with the subject at all, hasn't thought about it. Yeah. You know, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just it, the more you, I think, you think about, you know, um, where you know, if if you you know, if you genuinely see it as an unnecessary thing, just just tune into all the unnecessary things that are around you in that regard, um, and how much it's fundamental to life. Um, uh, Absolutely. And I guess it, it it denies the sense of 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 the spiritual of the a soul or or yes a, yeah. you know you know the, the, are, are we just a utilitarian you know and if you start to go down that route you <laughs> know, that's, you know, that's where yeah. we are at the minute isn't it that's what yeah, we're down and uh... yeah I mean it, it's almost you know it's it's you know it's extending the whole red pill metaphor it's like you know we are like a a little battery in a in in the powering the machines you know um yeah. uh, you know it's it, um it, it, yeah it, that's not yeah you, the utilitarian argument is so flawed and so evidently flawed um um and uh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. It, it's materialist know, it, as well at its heart it's materialist it doesn't uh, can't accept any yeah, yeah. It, well, it, 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 it's, or, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, it's offers you a window into. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's amazing how powerful Plato's idea on how beauty offers a window into the transcendent. How powerful that idea still is. You know yeah. how how long lasting it is. You know, I know it's um, it's you know inspired like Christian Christianity. Uh, and lots of artists and you know people throughout the ages uh. yeah but yeah yeah i mean that that's the thing with you know the you know um you know whether or not you believe in in various you know faiths and religions and stuff that um it, you know, it, it tended pretty much all the greats uh in in music and in art and and in architecture even um you know had had a had a uh a, 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 a a, a spiritual religious kind of impetus um it, you know i i guess there probably maybe a few people that that maybe uh were driven by a, a monarch or something but there's probably a sort of still there's a that sort of transcendent sense of uh you know uh, you know the um the the, the um you know the, the power that the the monarch embodies the legacy that they embody and Maybe yeah. the the concept of the nation as a as a wider entity, um, but it, it's still like a spiritual. Um, you know, uh, you know these people, these great creators, had that other that spiritual level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, no, you know, they weren't just cold, hard, utilitarian sort of beings. That it was, you know, purely about. Yeah, the, the, rational thought. It, the aim towards the true, the good, and the beautiful, and you know that's it's something yeah. to aim for. It's um, it's a, it's a good goal to have. Yeah. 
Well, it's, yeah. this has been a great uh, conversation. I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's getting quite late. <laughs> <laughs> sure well, it's been, it a, been a great conversation, Gilly. Um, loved uh, speaking with you. Yeah, good um, to talk to you too. Hopefully speak to you again in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks for uh, right. listening, everyone at home. Um, is there anything you'd like to uh, shield, Gilly? <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, probably probably just join uh, the Foundation Discord. <laughs> That's probably the only thing I could chill. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, see you next time. Bye.